Okay, welcome everybody to the um, Bellevue City Council regular meeting for May 7th, 2024. Since we are last here, light rail has opened in Bellevue. I hope you have a chance to uh, ride it from right outside here on the plaza. Um, City Clerk, could you do the roll call, please? Mayor Robinson. I'm here. Deputy Mayor Malakutian. Here. Councilmember Hamilton. Here. Councilmember Lee. Here. Councilmember Newenhouse. Here. Councilmember Stokes. Here. And Councilmember Zahn. Here. Councilmember Hamilton, will you lead us in the flag salute? Yes. So we have three proclamations tonight. We have Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, Month Proclamation, which will be read by Council Member Lee and accepted by Mami Shimamura. Then we'll have the International Firefighters Day Proclamation read by Council Member Hamilton and accepted by Acting Deputy Chief Mark Anderson. And lastly, we'll have the Public Service Recognition Week Proclamation read by Deputy Mayor Malakutian and accepted by Diane Carlson. I think we'll go ahead and read each one and, and have a picture maybe at the end, do all three pictures at the end if we can figure that out. So we'll start with uh, you, Council Member Lee. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Whereas about 24 million Americans proudly identify as having Asian, South Asian, Native Hawaiian, and or other Pacific Island heritage, and whereas Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islander form an American community of some 25 major ethnic groups who speak more than 15 different languages and belong to a whole variety of religions and cultures, and whereas approximately 42% of Bellevue's population is comprised of individuals of AANHPI heritage, among the largest percentages enjoyed by Washington cities. And several organizations host festivals and events in the city honoring the heritage of these communities. And whereas we acknowledge the institutional and systemic injustices that have historically impacted these communities, making it more difficult to be heard and seen, as well as the struggle to remain safe amid instances of hate and misinformation. And whereas Japanese immigrants played a key role in Bellevue's historical place as an agriculture center, and people from AANHPI backgrounds continue to enrich our region's culture through excellence in technology, the arts, and design. And whereas AANHPI entrepreneurs strengthen our economy and our communities through their dedication and ingenuity, inspiring the next generation of innovators by example. And whereas we strive to raise awareness of the history and contributions of the AANHPI community through the city's events, including an art exhibition featuring AANHPI artists, May 6th through 31. Now, therefore, I, Conrad Lee, on behalf of Lynn Robinson, Mayor of the City of Bellevue, Washington, and on behalf of the City Council, to hereby proclaim the month of May 2024 as Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month in Bellevue, and encourage all residents to celebrate the rich diversity of this community, to enjoy and appreciate their many contributions to our city, to reflect on the many challenges they are faced through history and in current times, and to join in looking forward to a future of hope, safety, and optimism. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Lee. I'd like to invite Mami Shimamura. She is a curator of the Celebrating Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Art Exhibit, which is on display out in the City Hall right now. Welcome. Yeah. And you don't need to touch the mic. It will pick up your voice. 
Did you want to speak? Okay. Um, I am the curator for this show this year, and I'm very proud of it. Um, I am um, Asian American, and uh, I appreciate Americans' inclusiveness. Um, I came here in 1973, and uh, I decided to make this as my home, and that was the right decision. Um, art brings all different cultures together, I believe, and it can make you feel like you belong to a, a big, warm family. And um, you are all invited to our reception, which is going to be tomorrow at 6 o'clock here. And uh, we have a special treat for you, which is a Japanese psych group. And uh, this show, as he said, will stay through the end of May. And um, I hope all of you enjoy. Um, I hope to see you tomorrow night. Great. Thank you. Uh, stick around, because when we're done with the proclamations, we'll come back up for a photo. All right. OK, next we have Council Member Hamilton reading the International Firefighters Day Proclamation. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> International, whereas International Firefighters Day is observed each year on May 4th to honor and remember past firefighters who have lost their lives while serving their communities, to express gratitude to those who have served in this line of work, and to show support and appreciation for those who presently serve, and whereas this commemoration was born out of a tragic loss of five firefighters on December 2nd, 1998, in a wildfire in Victoria, Australia. The resulting day of recognition was a way to honor their lives and the sacrifice firefighters are willing to make for the people they serve daily. And whereas the demands of firefighting are accompanied by both personal and physical tolls, that all firefighters knowingly accept while risking their lives to protect the lives of others. And whereas, at a moment's notice, firefighters are quick to respond to uncertain situations to mitigate danger and combat the threat of destructive, destructive fire or medical emergencies to protect individuals, families, and the economic well-being of our community, and whereas the Bellevue Fire Department has maintained continuous international accreditation from the Commission of Fire Accreditation International since 1998, demonstrating the commitment of all Bellevue firefighters to operate at the highest standards. Now, therefore, I, Dave Hamilton, on behalf of Lynn Robinson, Mayor of the City of Bellevue, Washington, and on behalf of its City Council, do hereby proclaim May 4th, 2024 as International Firefighters Day and encourage all residents to show support and appreciation to our City of Bellevue Fire Department and firefighters who diligently protect lives and property and by remembering past firefighters who dedicated their lives to preserve our safety. Thank you, Council Member. I'd like to invite Acting Deputy Chief Mark Anderson if you'd have, like to speak. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Robinson and Bellevue City Council members. I accept this proclamation on behalf of Fire Chief Jay Hagan, and I want to thank each and every one of you for your support for our current firefighters and our past firefighters as we seek to serve and care for the citizens of Bellevue and our contract cities, and I thank each and every one of you for that. And it allows us to do our job every day, and we love coming to work, and I thank you for your support. Great, thank you. Stick around and we'll do a photo later. And then um, Deputy Mayor Malakutian, could you please read the Public Service Recognition Week Proclamation? For sure, Mayor, thank you so much. <clears throat> Whereas people throughout the United States are assisted every day by public servants at the federal, state, county, and city levels, and normally doing their jobs behind the scenes, these employees strive to perform their task between efficiency, excellence, and integrity. And Bellevue's public servants, over 1,700 staff across 13 departments, are recognized as an invaluable resource, 
helping countless residents thrive on a daily basis across our increasingly diverse community. And many public servants, including road and utilities crews, police officers, firefighters, healthcare professionals, and military personnel, risk their lives daily doing their jobs. And public service is a noble calling involving a variety of challenging and rewarding professions. And we benefit daily from the knowledge and skills of the highly trained individuals who work in our government delivering exceptional public service. Now, therefore, I, Mo Malakutian, on behalf of Lynn Robinson, Mayor of the City of Bellevue, Washington, and on behalf of its, council, its City Council, do hereby proclaim the week of May 5 to 11, 2024 as Public Service Recognition Week in Bellevue and urge all community members to reflect on the contributions of public employees who carry out the missions of our various branches of government. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and I'd like to invite Acting City Manager Diane Carlson to speak. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as Acting City Manager, it is really an honor to accept this proclamation, um, recognizing Public Service uh, Recognition Week on behalf of our staff. Um, Every day, um, our staff is out there providing um, one of our top core values, excellent public service uh, to our community. And that service is really the backbone of what uh, makes this city thrive and um, continue to grow and continue to be the community that our um, current and future residents and um, employees and businesses uh, want to see. So. Um, you know, on behalf of the staff, I wanna thank the deputy mayor, the mayor and the council members for taking the time to um, provide this recognition in the, uh, in the proclamation and um, to really um, honor the professionalism and the excellent service that our staff uh, does provide to our community every day. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, let's do a picture with mommy to start with. Approve the agenda. I move to approve the agenda. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, City Clerk, uh, do we have anybody registered for oral communications? Thank you, yes, Mayor. There are seven pre-registered speakers this evening. So before I start calling names, I'll go over a few of the rules that the council has put in place. So first, oral communications is for a period of no more than 30 minutes, and all topics must relate to City of Bellevue government. People speaking to items on tonight's agenda will be called first, and then if time remains, people speaking to items not on the agenda will be called. In each of those categories, the presiding officer has preference or can give preference to people who have not spoken to council within the last 60 days or people speaking to items that will come on the council's agenda within the next 60 days. Speakers are allowed up to three minutes to speak, and only three speakers will be allowed to speak to one side of a particular topic. With that, we'll call our first speaker, who is Talika Duggar. And I'm going to, this is not to you, Talika, this is to all our speakers tonight, ask that we be polite and respectful and that we speak to things that have to do with the Bellevue City Council. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, City Council, and everybody, staff, we are very happy to be here. Um, I am Tulika Dugar. She, her is my pronouns. I work with IACS as the Small Business Services Lead, and I'm also a crisis navigator, also a resident of Bellevue. We at IACS are very happy to have grown with Bellevue Mini City Hall as a constant partner with us. Over the last four years at the Crossroads Mall space, we have been able to not only meet with community members regularly, but also help folks from outside the Indian diaspora to use our wraparound services. The, the folks at Mini City Hall are so easy and collaborative to work with. I have the greatest experience with Ying for our touchpoint person, Ashish for small business, 
Pranaya for job-related questions, Ramu and the entire team at the Mini City Hall as we avail and find the right resources that match the current and changing needs of folks around this area on a case basis. The Mini City Hall helps us meet the community, create familiarity with new immigrants, share the resources Indian American Community Services offers and also walk through them on assessing their needs. Our wraparound services include senior, early childhood, women, career, small business, mental health, youth, civic engagement, and more. We are excited for this new space and to wish to be able to keep growing as partners as we access this new space. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Galen Helmgren. Are you oh, done? Am I done? I have a little bit left. That's fine. Please keep going. <laughs> yeah, sorry. We are excited to work with more partnerships as we see them develop. I'm thrilled about the passport services, future sound energy, and about this place having the capacity to welcome inclusive partnerships, making it a vibrant space, and building those bridges as we navigate through these present times. We hope to continue to strengthen this relationship across borders and model this toward a full circle approach to all. I really want Bellevue, City of Bellevue to be like a role model for other cities in this regard. We thank you for giving us this opportunity to work with you. IACS is immensely grateful for the partnership with Bellevue Mini City Hall with City of Bellevue and also as we look at more milestones along the way. Thank you so much. Thank you, Talika. <laughs> My apologies. Our, now our next speaker is Galen Helmgren. I believe Galen is joining us virtually. Can you hear me? Galen, can you hear me? It looks like you're unmuted, but we cannot hear you. Can you try one more time? I'm going to connect with you offline and see if we can figure out the technical difficulty here. I'll go to our next speaker right now, which is Melinda Carbon. Hello, my name is Melinda Carbon, and I'm a member of Trees for Livability. I'm a 20 year resident of Bellevue and with my husband, a homeowner in the Lake Hills neighborhood. I'm here tonight to talk about the tree canopy land use, um, the LUCA, that will be coming before City Council at a study session on May 21st. First, I'd like to thank Christina Gallant and Nick Whipple and their team for the thoughtful and comprehensive work that they have done in drafting this proposal. They have done a laudable job of listening to the public, engaging stakeholders, and researching the strategies that other nearby cities are successfully employing. And in doing so, they have struck a good balance between tree protection and allowing for all kinds of development, including adding flexibility for high density developments. Second, I would like to urge you council members to adopt this proposal quickly. The road to these new improved tree codes has been a long one, and all the while, trees that would be protected under this new code are being lost, many of them landmark trees. I would like to call particular attention to what has been happening in my neighborhood of Lake Hills. I know that the latest tree canopy survey looks encouraging if you look at it from a citywide perspective, but there is a huge disparity between neighborhoods. The 2023 tree canopy report showed that though Lake Hills is one of the city's largest neighborhoods, it contained only 9% of the city's tree cover as of 2021, and that this is due to the loss of 35 acres of tree canopy between 2019 and 2021. This report only looked at data through 2021, but I can tell you from personal observation that tree loss has been accelerating in Lake Hills and nearby neighborhoods since then. Since 2020, there has been a luxury home building boom in Lake Hills. Developers have purchased hundreds of properties in the area, and taking advantage of the current tree codes, loopholes in the codes, and the lax enforcement of the codes, these developers have removed hundreds of trees in Lake Hills over the last couple of years, oftentimes completely clearing a property of all trees, including many landmark trees. My house was built in 1958, and many of the homes in Lake Hills were built in the same time frame. So many of the large trees that exist in Lake Hills today are 50 to 60 years old. These trees are a resource for all of the homes around them, 
uh, not just the property on which they stand. They provide heat protection for a wide radius of nearby properties. They provide homes for owls, hawks, and even eagles, which do their part to keep down the rodent and small mammal population. And this ecological benefit is something that smaller, less mature trees cannot support. And of course, these large trees uh, provide clean air, among many other community benefits. Every week that passes without these new tree protections, we are losing more and more of these tree resources at the hands of developers who are only temporary owners of these properties and thus are not motivated stewards of their natural resources. So finally, I'm asking again that you act quickly to approve these new tree codes so that this city can become stewards of these valuable community resources and we can preserve as many of these large trees as is practicable. Thank you. The next speaker is Chris Pierce. Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to present. I'm a longtime uh, Bellevue homeowner. I've uh, been in the city for about 25 years, but my first time uh, presenting here. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, I think I appreciate the, the city's uh, attention to preserving the character that we have in the various neighborhoods around the city, the aesthetics, the integrity, and, and ultimately the shared, uh, shared benefit of the higher property values. I'd like to draw your attention to a particular code uh, I think it's a land use code uh, referenced as 202470, which uh, addresses inoperable vehicles stored on residential properties. Um, the, the ordinance uh, reflects the, the desire to preserve the character of the neighborhood, but I would like to call your attention to the fact that it's insufficient at actually allowing the compliance officers to do their job in terms of affecting the cars that are stored in a large quantity on, uh, on various residences. So working closely with uh, the city's compliance team, we've struggled to find resolution in a, in a number of situations near, uh, near my neighborhood. So the current ordinance has no upper limit on the number of inoperable vehicles stored on a particular parcel. So in my neighborhood, for example, historical abuses have exceeded 20 cars on an individual parcel. And, and that's challenging for us in, in maintaining this character. So we're looking for your help on placing a reasonable limit on the number of vehicles. My neighbors and I would like to advocate for one or two, but we look for your guidance in, in something that would be reasonable uh, citywide. Um, in addition, the ordinance goes on to describe how a vehicle should be stored when it is on the property with some screening obligations and planting, and, and um, it, it repeatedly references as though it is storing a single vehicle, but it doesn't say a single vehicle. Furthermore, it doesn't talk about how cars are parked in the screening uh, objective. So if you imagine a vehicle parked on a fence line, the picture would show the car parked the long way against the fence line, sort of screening the object with the greatest view from the neighbor. In this case, the, the parcel owner just stacks the cars uh, perpendicular to the fence over and over and over. So if you imagine a, a car lot kind of parking in the most efficient manner. So we would look for the city to provide guidance in that capacity that you know they're stored in parallel with the fence line or something from a specificity. So look for your assistance with that um, in allowing us to work uh, hand in hand with the existing code compliance officers and, uh, and help us bring this to conclusion. So appreciate your time. Mr. Pierce, I'm gonna ask that you, if you haven't already, send an email to the council on this, uh, to um, council at bellevuewa.gov. Okay. Okay, sure. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, our next speaker is Don Marsh. Good evening. As you may know, the Bellevue Planning Commission unanimously approved updates to the city's tree protection code. The council will soon have an opportunity to approve the proposed regulations as well. As a member of Trees for Livability, 300 Trees, and other nonprofit organizations that have advocated for trees during the past decade, I'd like to offer some perspective on what we have accomplished so far. After witnessing disturbing trends of tree removal, Trees for Livability began studying tree protection codes in other cities three years ago. The organization distributed a petition which has gathered, garnered over 1,700 signatures from Bellevue residents. Two years ago, city staff began to research and develop code updates for our city. They engaged residents, 
and stakeholders early, involving everyone in the process. The resulting proposal is a reasonable compromise that balances the needs of citizens, the environment, and the need for continued growth in affordable housing. You are going to hear various criticisms of one detail or another, but please know that you can't easily pull on one or two threads without disturbing the careful balance the authors have achieved. I urge you to approve these regulations and then adjust them when needed, just as you recently did with Bellevue's construction noise ordinance. I would suggest that similar tweaks can be made to these tree regulations as we gain some experience with their strengths as well as their rough edges. What we can't afford is more years of debate as the trees of Bellevue face a triple threat. First, infrastructure projects like light rail, the widening of I-405 and I-90, and construction of large transmission lines have destroyed thousands of trees during the past decade. Second, we are seeing unprecedented destruction of trees in single family neighborhoods as developers scrape lots and build the largest homes allowed, leaving little room for replacement trees. Third, the twin threats of higher temperatures and altered precipitation patterns are stressing trees and making them vulnerable to disease, infestation, and increasingly powerful windstorms. These threats are somewhat mitigated by large-scale tree giveaways held by the city of Bellevue and 300 trees, but we know that our small trees do not match the carbon storage and air quality benefits of the large trees that we are losing at an alarming rate. I ask you to support our efforts to maintain the rich tree canopy that is one of the distinguishing features of our city, providing residents of today and tomorrow with a high quality of life. By being smart, Bellevue can develop and grow while preserving the city in a park, which we know and love. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to circle back to Galen Helmgren. Galen, can you hear me now? Um, I do see your microphone moving, but we don't hear you. I'm going to ask those in the back room to see if you can adjust the volume for the virtual speakers. I'm going to circle back one more time. And that would bring us to our next speaker, who's Paul Quinn. Looks like Mr. Quinn is joining us virtually as well. Mr. Quinn, can you hear me? OK. It is a problem with our uh, virtual participants. Hold, please. I'm going to circle back again. Next speaker is Alex Zimmerman. Alex Zimmerman, and I am president of Stand Up America. Um, I want to give one question what is totally confused me, you know what it means. Why you, uh, Mayor Robertson, interrupt me in every meeting? You know what it means. It's go for many years. So forgive me for my uh, analysis. I'm not a doctor, but this looks to me like you have a maniacal syndrome, you know what it means, because you can't do this in every meeting. <laughs> For how many years? <laughs> Ten? Five? <laughs> Guys, we're talking about government, what is controlled by people who, for my understanding, have a little bit psychology problem. So when fish are always stinking from head, you know what it means, how is government can be good. For my example, for the last 35 years, I think first complaint come 35 years, I make a dozen and dozen complaints to Bellevue and to policemen, everything. I never have one positive word for 30 plus years. It's good government. So everything what is we have right now here is absolutely idiotic to my understanding. Idiotic is absolutely legal word. Because I don't understand how consul who live in Bellevue only for 10 years and come from another country like Iranian Muslim, for example, country, can be a deputy mayor. Can you explain to me? And I spoke from Tacoma to Everett in dozen and dozen cities. I never see like this before. 
for be a mayor, for be a deputy mayor, you need to qualify for this. Qualification can be or your level, or what is you doing for your country and for everything. To me, this look like you are a mentally sick people, guys. You hate Jew and you hate American. I don't understand how I can explain another word. Forgive me, maybe I'm not too much polite, you know what I mean. From my point of view and from Constitution, in court decision, 100 court decision, maybe dozen court decision, I speak absolutely legally, you know what I mean. Because when we don't touch this fascism, what is to look to me like a cancer right now and go bigger and bigger every day. Look what is you did right now with this state, with King County, you know what is mean? Controlling one party system. In one party system in all civilized country, you know what is mean? Never in not civilized country is a pure fascism. It's go bigger and bigger and bigger. You cut and cut and cut. You don't give every chance people speak about problem what is make us painful. You understand more painful we American. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our final two speakers are our two virtual participants. I'm going to circle back one more time. Galen Helmgren, can you hear me? Galen Helmgren? I'm going to ask one more time if staff in the back can raise the volume. Okay, we just now finally have you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Your time begins now. Okay, it feels like we've been talking about trees forever. In fact, efforts to revise the code date back to 2021. I urge the council to support trees for livability by passing the land use code draft amendment as soon as possible. April 2024 was the hottest record, April on record in the U.S. and the 10 warmest years in the 174 years of record keeping have all occurred during the last decade. This year's El Nino cycle caused a statewide snowpack that is only 65% of our annual average. Drought is on the way. While trees themselves can't make more rain, traditionally an El Nino season is followed by La Nina, and a common feature of La Nina cycles are heat domes. The 2021 heat dome over Washington caused 157 deaths statewide, the deadliest weather-related disaster in state history. My neighborhood, Lake Hills, is the hottest neighborhood in the city based on King County's 2021 heat mapping project. We also have the least tree canopy coverage in the entire city. More urbanized areas were measured by the county as being 20 degrees hotter than more natural landscapes. As an anecdote during the aforementioned heat dome, the outside temperature in my backyard was 136 degrees. 136 degrees. My neighborhood is full of retired original residents who still live here, and most homes don't have air conditioning. We lost 65 acres of residential trees in Bellevue between 2019 and 21. For perspective, Bellevue Downtown Park is only 20 acres. Crossroads Park is 34 acres. The entirety of Bellevue Botanical Gardens is a mere 53 acres. And this data doesn't take into account the last few years where predatory developers like MN Custom Homes and J-Mart have been clear-cutting lots without cause just because they can. I would be interested to see during our next canopy audit what percentage of Bellevue's 32 square miles of land are covered in pavement, broken down by neighborhood, compared to our stated goal of canopy cover. Thank you. Thank you, and that was our third and final speaker on trees this evening. Our next and final speaker is Paul Quinn. Mr. Quinn, Mr. Quinn can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me? We can. Your time begins now. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. My name is Paul Quinn, and I live in Sammamish. I'm speaking to you as an individual that cares about recycling and composting and reducing what we send to the landfill. I want to give a shout out uh, to Deputy Mayor uh, Coutinho for his support of recycling and composting in Bellevue. Let's start with a reminder from a King County survey of trash sent to the landfill, which showed that two thirds of what is sent to the landfill can be either recycled or composted. So two, th two thirds of our trash is actually not trash. I provided you by email three handouts. 
The first handout reflects disposal numbers updated now with year-to-date March. And to clarify, when I say diversion rates, that means the percentage of disposed tonnage diverted away from the landfill and to recycling and food scraps compost. So as you can see in the handout with the tables, the numbers on it, the rate in this year, first quarter this year versus last year's first quarter is down. So diversion rates are going down and we want them to go up. And as importantly, Bellevue's diversion rate has been declining since 2021. So the city needs a new approach to improve diversion, and tonight I have a proposal that will do just that. King County is offering grants right now for innovative recycling and composting projects. I provided you with a handout that has a completed grant proposal to provide smart disposal to a city to be named. Let's make that city Bellevue. I need a city partner to apply for this grant with me, and then we can provide single-family residents with direct personal feedback and education based on their own disposal habits. Let me tell you what Smart Disposal is. Smart Disposal weighs each container emptied by the hauler for single-family homes. This system, through a postcard mailed to each resident, will provide data specific to their address, include their own diversion rate for individual household, and a trend line. And I've provided an example postcard as a separate handout in the email. This system helps us move from toss and forget mindset towards making better choices. We all know feedback through measurement works because water, electricity, and gas are all metered, helping us to moderate our use. Smart disposal effectively meters our actual use of the disposal utility. During the pilot, the city will bear no cost as the completed grant request I provided you covers all costs. The city of Bellevue and its hauler will be my partners on this project. The grant partners, the grant submission request has urgency as the King County grant application must be submitted by May 29th. People in the city of Bellevue want to live sustainably. Join me with Smart Disposal. Let's get our diversion rate moving in the right direction. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was our last pre-registered speaker, and we do have a few minutes left, so I would ask if there's anyone joining us this evening who would like to make a comment to the council, please raise your hand. And again, if anyone is joining us online, please use the raise hand function. Okay, Mayor, I see no hands. I'll turn it back to you. Okay, Charmaine, I'd like to thank you and staff for working so hard that we, so that we could hear the people calling in. Um, next up, we have the report of our city manager. Thank you, Mayor Robinson. Uh, we have some exciting news to share tonight, and uh, this is about Bellevue's mini city hall. So I'm very happy to introduce Mike McCormick Huntelman, uh, who's our assistant director in community development, and also Ying Carlson, who is the manager of uh, Bellevue's mini city hall. They're here tonight to share this news with you, uh, with council and with the community, and with that I will turn it over to Mike. City Manager Carlson, Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor Malakuchin, Council Members. Uh, tonight, we get to provide you with a little bit of an opening or information and an invitation. So 30 years ago, Mini City Hall started as a pilot project uh, hosted by volunteers uh, to see if we could lower barriers to access to our community to connect to city uh, services. Well, it worked. Uh, and last year, one of the things that you did is you added an expansion of Mini City Hall and the facility to our legislative agenda, and then you approved a new 10-year lease at our new spot. So we have been under construction uh, for the last six months, and we are going to give you a formal invitation. Um, let me see if I can advance the slide. Come on, baby. There we go. Um, to come to our grand opening celebration uh, next week, Wednesday, uh, at 11 a.m. at Crossroads Shopping Mall. And we'll open up our new location. And for more information about Mini City Hall uh, and what has happened, how we got here, I'm going to turn things over to Ying Carlson, our Mini City Hall supervisor. Ying? Thank you, Mike. Um, thanks for having us here tonight. Um, it just really, I'm really excited to be here to kind of share with you what's really happening at the Crossroads Mini City Hall. Um, 
Let me open. There you go. Okay. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background about our program, and I'm going to share some partnerships that we have built over the years and some new ones that we are um, trying to establish. And of course, the most exciting thing, I'm going to give you a little preview of our um, new facility and then the big party that you are invited to come next week. So the mini city hall story really started about 30 years ago in 1994. And it was born from this visionary idea to bring local government services directly to the people to serve them where they are at um, in, their no, uh, in their local community. And it was a really a pioneer effort at the time for uh, community engagement to establish an office inside a shopping mall where people are gathering um, and look at that as a, their third place, a gathering place in the community. And it drastically lower barriers uh, for folks to engage with government and also to access service, especially for those who are um, having limited English skills, who are disabled, um, and less tech savvy, new to Bellevue, or even um, fearful of government. And over the past 30 years, um, Mini City Hall has evolved to be one of the best model for delivering culturally competent and also multilingual services to the community. And because our um, location inside a shopping mall and um, it's a really a unique position to really hear from people, we have all sorts of people coming into Mini City Hall kind of sharing their story, sharing their background with us. And really, we're hearing the needs of the community, and we're tracking the trends, and then we match those needs with organizations that provide the services in the community. And to make it even more accessible, we bring these organizations on site um, so they can hold office hours at Mini City Hall and to provide those services directly to the residents of Bellevue. And it's really a one-stop shop model um, to bring right range of service to the community. And these services range from helping seniors sign up for Medicare, new immigrants navigating government system, to finding resources for their family, um, to learning English, looking for work, um, starting a new business in Bellevue, um, computer and smartphone coaching classes, or people looking for rent assistance or affordable housing. Now, in the latest human service update, it called for a cultural navigation program to connect people um, to resources and information. And I want to say this is exactly what Mini City Hall does. And that's what we do there. We connect people with resources. Um, in any given year, um, we serve over 20,000 people um, in Mini City Hall, and we handle more than 40,000 requests. And I would say 60% to 80% of those requests are human services related. And with more than half of those have a language or cultural component to it. And our staff are bilingual. And along with our community partners, uh, we provide services in many, many languages besides English, such as Mandarin, Cantonese, Telugu, Spanish, Vietnamese, Russian, Ukrainian, Arabic, Farsi, Dari, and um, Somali. So with the new space, we'll be able to bring even more services and newer partnerships to Mini City Hall. And some examples are Africans on the east side, um, an organization that are um, to provide support for our African immigrant population. And we're working with um, Puget Sound Energy to uh, provide uh, energy assistance program to um, the resident of, residents of Bellevue to lower their energy bills. And we are also working with Immigrant Women Community Center uh, where a case, manage will, case manager will come to Mini City Hall to help folks navigate housing and employment issues. And soon, Mini City Hall will be one of the two passport acceptance agencies in Bellevue besides the post office. And that's a really popular service. And lots of people are like, I can't get through to the post office to get a live person. This is really exciting uh, for our community. And of course, we continue to bring uh, many city programs and services to Mini City Hall so they become even more accessible for our community. Uh, now, you can see in the um, PowerPoint here that picture is our part, one of our partners and is taking in the hallway of the shopping center. And I want to say for many years, that's where most of our partners operate. It's at a table outside the mini city hall in the hallway. Um, because our mini city hall was so tiny that we could not possibly host all the partnerships. 
So they have to compromise and operate in the hallway instead. Um, and you can imagine that's not really an ideal situation for our partners as they are talking about sometimes really sensitive issues, helping folks to navigate um, resources. So it's really difficult. Um, and for the past few months, while construction's ongoing, our own mini city hall staff, our employees, are also moving to the hallway because our lease has ended and the new space is not yet available. So we've been working there as well in the hallway with our partners. And I want to big a, give a big kudos to our staff and our team really holding down the fort and continue to provide that service for the community so there's no disruption to services because many folks come to us and make that connection and see the familiar faces and it's really essential for them to be there. And I just wanna thank our staff for that. Um, as you can imagine, that's why we are super excited um, to move from the hallway to this new space. Um, in the um, upper hand, upper um, right corner there, you can see there's a rendering of our new space. And it's not gonna look exactly like that, but it gives you an idea what what we, what we have there. Um, I want to really thank the council for your vision and your ongoing support for Mini City Hall and for the community that we serve there. As without your support, we could not have gotten it here. And it's really, you know, just really grateful for all that you do for us. Um, and this new space features a nice lobby and people will be able to wait there for service uh, and a self-service area and reception area that can serve up to three clients at a time and two partnership rooms where they can close the door and have a private conversation and really understand people's needs, right? And then uh, we also have um, a small conference room for workshops and other functions. And it's just been truly um, amazing to kind of see the new space being built out. And here you can see some pictures um, and construction's been ongoing for about six months now. And it's truly a one city effort um, to coordinate the construction with other departments such as IT and special kudos for our um, facility and asset management department leading the project management effort to work with TCA architects and Sabre construction. Um, so we're just really nice to be every day kind of going to the mall and seeing the space being built out. Every day looks a little bit different. Uh, and the anticipation from the community is also growing. Interest is growing. Folks ask us every day, when are you moving? You know, what is it going to look like? What services are you going to bring to Mini City Hall? So everyone is really excited about that. Um, so we just really can't wait to move into our new space and provide more and better services for our community. And with that, I'm gonna end my um, presentation with an invitation for all of you to come next Wednesday, um, May 15 at 11 o'clock uh, at the Crossroads Shopping Center. Uh, we'll have a big party, we'll have food, music, and a community resource fair that feature all of our partners. We hope you can join us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the presentation. We're looking forward to. Thank when, you. Um, is that on, a, yeah, Wednesday, next Wednesday. Okay, next up we have the consent calendar. Is there a motion to approve? I move to approve the consent calendar. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we have two study session items tonight, and uh, Ms. Carlson, I'll let you introduce the first one. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we have a special guest with us tonight, Cameron Gurl, who is King County's Wastewater Treatment Division Director. And he's here tonight to brief the council on the proposed 2025 sewer rate and capacity charge um, and the 10-year rate forecast and ongoing work related to the long-term forecasting and regional wastewater services plan. And as you will hear, the King County rates have a direct impact on Bellevue's customers. And the need for planning and forecasting into the future um, is increasing with the needs of the regional system, so it's an important local and regional concern. Cameron is joined tonight by our Director of Utilities, Lucy Liu, and from the City Manager's Office, Ella Williams, Intergovernmental Policy Advisor. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lucy to frame the conversation and the request of the Council following Cameron's presentation. Thank you, Ms. Carlson. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and Council Members. Uh, tonight, you will be receiving an informational briefing from King County 
uh, from Cameron about their 2025 uh, sewer rate and capacity charge proposal, uh, their 10-year forecasts, and some ongoing work that they're doing related to long-term forecasting and updating their regional uh, wastewater services plan. After the briefing uh, by um, Ms. Dergarol, Bellevue staff will be seeking your direction and feedback uh, in a letter to the King County Council on these topics. Um, and it's just as background, King County is a very important regional partner to Bellevue Utilities. Uh, the King County Wastewater Treatment Division provides Bellevue with sewer treatment services uh, to protect public health and the environment. And uh, they operate three large regional facilities, uh, including the South Plant, which is located in Renton, which is where most of Bellevue sewage is treated. Um, the cost that we pay to King County for wastewater treatment services are passed directly th uh, through to our sewer rate payers. Uh, and um, these costs are uh, represent a little bit uh, over half of the typical residential sewer bill, uh, or that's roughly one quarter of the total utility bill paid by our residents for all three services, water, sewer, and storm. Um, Utility services are essential life services, and so affordability is especially important in this area. And to that end, the city provides a suite of rate assistance programs uh, to serve our low-income utility customers. Uh, the utility rate relief programs help our uh, low-income seniors and residents with disabilities to lower their uh, utility costs by providing a 70% discount. We also offer emergency assistance to residents that are experiencing a one-time financial shock, um, such as a job loss that interferes with their ability to meet basic needs. We are also expanding temporary relief uh, to residents uh, who are at risk of having their water shut off. Uh, the city also provides a rebate of utility taxes to low-income uh, uh, customers and residents. And so together, uh, this suite of assistance programs provides about a million dollars of assistance uh, each year to about a thousand households in Bellevue. Um, beyond utility rate relief, our human services programs, uh, such as our um, rental and mortgage assistance program, our home repair assistance program, also assist our residents with uh, overall affordability challenges in other areas. Um, with that said, uh, given the uh, impact of rising sewer cost on Bellevue customers, uh, we appreciate uh, the King County's ongoing efforts to uh, mitigate rate pressures and find opportunities to contain cost as much as possible. Um, each year, the Wastewater Treatment Division um, updates the rates that they charge to contract agencies such as Bellevue. These rates are reviewed by the uh, Regional Water Quality Committee uh, on which Councilmember Lee serves as the Vice Chair and the rates are adopted by the King County Council. Um, and so after Mr. Gorel's briefing, um, Bellevue staff will be seeking your uh, direction on three areas tonight. Uh, the proposed King County 2025 sewer rate, uh, the long-term forecasting tool uh, that the uh, wastewater treatment division is working on in the next couple of years, as well as update of the regional wastewater services plan. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Grill. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, very much appreciate the time here tonight. It's nice to see a lot of familiar faces, so thank you for having us. I think we were here two years ago, so it's nice to be back again. Uh, we always appreciate the opportunity to talk with the City of Bellevue or any one of our 34 contract agencies um, as we go through the annual sewer rate process. also want to thank Mayor Robinson, uh, Councilmember Lee for your service on the Regional Water Quality uh, Committee, um, the rest of the Council for your leadership. Uh, Bellevue remains a leader in sustainability and many other things. And listening to some of your public comment, I see that issues are alive and well uh, here in Bellevue. Um, I'll get through, I assume this is... Uh, the way to go through this, there we go. Here's the agenda for tonight. Uh, we'll go through some of the goals that we have for our annual sewer rate process, the proposed sewer rate itself, some of the drivers for that rate. We're also gonna talk about the capacity charge, that's a more modest uh, change this year, and then talk a little bit about affordability. Uh, our goals that we always set out each year for uh, our sewer rate development include um, increasing reliability of our system, uh, making sure that we can not only keep the water in the pipe, but meet all of our permit conditions and deliver good service that's reliable for all of the 
uh, 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 people that we serve. And it's about, it's close to 2 million residents within the urbanized area of King County. Uh, we also want to make sure that we address our most critical asset management needs. Um, uh, we have to deal with many uh, regulatory requirements. I'm sure the city's familiar with those challenges. We have increasing growth-related demands on our system. Uh, we have King County policies and programs that also we have to meet since we are a King County agency. So those include the Clean Water Healthy Habitat Strategy and our Strategic Climate Action Plan and our Equity and Social Justice Plan. Uh, we always want to propose a rate that reflects just the most important, the highest priority investments, and of course we have to meet key financial metrics as well. And I'll just mention, we just met with our two rating agencies for bonds uh, to uh, give them a presentation just last week, because keeping our, our bond ratings high to keep the cost low associated with that is important as well. Uh, so here's a slide with, uh, that violates PowerPoint rules with too much on it, uh, so thank you for your patience as we go through this. The, Top uh, rows here are the um, uh, rate um, uh, forecast for last year. So you can see it starts with the 2024 rate. That's what's in place today. And then sort of moving from left to right across, you'll see the rate goes out to 2033. So that's 10 years worth of, of rate forecast that we do, a proposed rate, and then the rate forecast. The table below that is the rate for this year. So we've replicated the rate for 2024, and then you can see it now starts with 2025 and moves out one more year out to 2034. So the rate for 2025 that you can see under that column there uh, is like the rate that was forecast last year, an increase of 5.75% to a rate of $58.28. That's a rate increase of $3.17. So we have maintained the rate that we forecast last year in the proposed rate for this year. Uh, and we're, we're doing our best to try to, ha to do that so that local jurisdictions like the city of Bellevue um, have a, a bit more predictability for your uh, utility and for your residents if we can keep to that, that as best as we can. What has changed though, as you look further out, is that the rest of the rate forecast is higher this year. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So uh, we continue to project uh, or prioritize our most critical asset management pro uh, projects. Um, we have a, um, a consent decree in, in King County for our CSO part of our system. That is our combined sewer overflows that are, are built in part of the system that serves the Seattle based portion of our system. We are going through a modification of that consent decree right now. And so we've put in an assumption, we've used this for several years, of moving that uh, consent decree completion date out to 2040. Continue to support increasing our capital program and, and, and additional operation staffing needs. We, uh, for those of you who are interested in a lot of financial planning, uh, we have a cash funding approach here um, where uh, we've been moving uh, to use a depreciation-based approach that averages about 32% cash funding of our capital program over the 10-year forecast period. And we are continuing to only charge what we can spend with lower accomplishment rates in the near term. Uh, we're gonna review that approach later this year so you may see some changes in next year's um, program. I'll talk a little bit more about that in an upcoming slide. In fact, this is a good slide to talk about. The dashed line that you can see in this bar graph is really the accumulation of all of the different costs associated with our capital program if we completed everything. And that adds up, you can see in the sort of inset box there, to about $10.5 billion over 10 years. It's a very big number. Now, after you uh, impose the accomplishment rate on, on those, uh, which means we're, we're not saying we can accomplish all of that um, in, in each of those years, it adds up to about $8.2 billion. And we've put the, the bars in the, in the bar graph here in color so you can see what's really driving each of those rates. And I often talk about what I call the big three. So the two colors of blue are our asset management, uh, the, the uh, dark blue for our, our treatment plants and the lighter blue for our conveyance system. That's a big portion of our capital program. The green color that you can see here um, is the regulatory requirements. And then the sort of uh, orangish color, I guess you'd say, is our capacity improvements. That's our, our contractual obligations to make sure that we have enough 
capacity in our system to meet the needs of growth. Those are the big three. There are other colors, and you can see the um, descriptions for the other colors out there. They certainly contribute, but not at the level that the big three do. You can see on this chart that what the one that's getting really bigger over time is the green one. That's the regulatory requirements. All comes out of the Federal Clean Water Act, whether directly from EPA or through the State Department of Ecology. These are the requirements that we have to meet to meet our regulatory obligations. So that, I'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes, but that is definitely one of the bigger drivers and it's increasing over time. How do we fund all of this? Well, we use, as I mentioned before, a combination of cash, cash and debt. The cash is shown down below. That's relatively stable over the projected or the forecast period. Um, it's averaged about 32%, as I mentioned before. Um, uh, that's in the sort of orangish color. Um, the other pieces on there, you can see the uh, sort of lightish blue color is the bonds, and I mentioned that uh, we met with the rating agencies just recently. Those are, light, are projected to increase. We're also using wherever we can uh, the gray and the black there. Um, those are the other two colors um, that uh, reflect the in the gray, uh, the state revolving fund. Um, that is federal money that's uh, uh, provided through the State Department of Ecology through a revolving fund uh, to us. And then directly from the federal government uh, are the WIFIA loans. And you may have heard about the trans transit equivalent of that, of TIFIA loans, if you talk about sound transit here in this setting. Well, WIFIA is the same kind of idea. So uh, very low interest loans uh, that we can get uh, through the United States Environmental Protection Agency for wastewater purposes. And in fact, we had an event not too long ago um, where we had a high-level official from EPA come out and celebrate that we, we did a WIFIA master agreement um, with EPA. Uh, that master agreement, uh, it totals almost a half a billion dollars in WIFIA loans. And these are wonderfully low interest rate loans. That package alone is going to save ratepayers almost $74 million over the course of those, those loan amounts. So it's a great deal for ratepayers. We're going to continue to take advantage of those loans um, as best we can. But debt, in whatever form, whether it's bonds or loans, has to be paid back. Um, and it's different than grants. And what you see on there in that green um, is a uh, color for grants, but I challenge you to see anywhere on the bars that you see any form of, of actual grants. There's actually something there. Um, I think there's a tiny bit in 24 and 25 on grants, but it's a tiny, tiny bit. And, and that's, that's what's, what's really wrong, frankly, in my view with this picture, is that we should be uh, finding more opportunities for grants, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, that we're working to try to make that happen. Uh, so here's what that, those rate projections look like, kind of in another form. You can see the 2025 rate shown kind of in that dashed uh, uh, circle box or box that, that's on there. And you can see last year's rate projection in blue getting out to 2033, just under $100. This year's rate projection in orange um, starts to diverge from last year's when you get to eh, 28, 29 or so, and then ends up... Uh, 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 at a higher level. We also do a capacity charge every year. This is the system buy-in charge. Uh, so if there's a, a new house that's being developed or multifamily building uh, that's being developed, uh, to buy into the system, uh, this is the sort of growth, pays for growth way we, we accomplish that. Uh, we charge a capacity charge, and we update that as well every year. We go through a process where we do a, a more formal uh, update every three years, and then in between those three years, um, we use a, a set rate. In this case, we're in that sort of in-between time. So this year for 2025, it's the, the set rate of 2.5% increase. So it's a more modest increase. You can see moving um, the monthly charge from $74.23, which is what's in place this year, to $76.09. Uh, we will be looking at updating our capacity charge methodology um, in the coming couple of years. Um, be excited to work with uh, Director Liu and others um, to go through a review of that methodology and uh, make changes. It's probably more complex than it needs to be, and there's some other models out there that I think we can follow that uh, will make it uh, a little easier to, for everyone to see, um, and we look forward to getting that done. <clears throat> 
Let me talk a little bit about uh, affordability. As I mentioned, sewer rates are forecast to continue to rise. Rates are projected to double over the next 10 years. We know that's an impact on Bellevue, on Bellevue residents, on the ratepayers, whether you're renting or owning, you're in some way paying those costs. And I'll note that the wastewater system in, in our region is funded nearly entirely by local ratepayers. That's what I mean when I, I grumble a little bit about the lack of grants out there is that it's really on the backs of ratepayers, whether it's through cash or through paying uh, debt, uh, that's who's uh, uh, paying for this. And we all know that low income ratepayers are hit uh, the hardest uh, with rate increases. Uh, we are, do take advantage of federal financial help. It is overwhelmingly through loans, as I mentioned, the revolving uh, uh, loan fund and the WIFIA program, but rates must still rise to, rise to pay these back. We also are not prioritized for some funding options as a regional agency um, because uh, the way the state does uh, definitions uh, for their programs for disadvantaged communities, King County uh, is unfortunately um, out of the picture there. So we're working to try to correct that as best we can. And in fact, I'll, I'll report that our county executive and uh, county council member Balducci, who represents the city on the county council and is the chair of the regional uh, uh, Water Quality Committee. We're just in Washington, D.C. Um, to lobby uh, for both of the things that you see in the two inset bullets um, at the bottom here, uh, working to reduce uh, utility costs for low-income households by encouraging EPA to provide better guidance to state agencies. In this case, it's to the State Department of Ecology that um, uh, we would hope uh, would reconsider their their policies so that we have better access to those funding options uh, and can pass on those savings to low-income households within our service area. And then we'd love to see the federal government create a new federal grant or for forgivable loan program so that uh, the water bodies that we're protecting, like Puget Sound, which are really national level resources, can also enjoy some national level funding uh, for that uh, to occur, rather than that being entirely on the backs of local ratepayers. Uh, it was mentioned uh, we have a regional wastewater services plan update starting. I only have the one simple slide here, and I'd be happy to come back at another time and talk more about this process. It's really getting um, off the ground here in these first few months of, of 2024. So there'll be more to say in coming months here. Just to mention our, our mission, we try to achieve that every day, protecting public health and the environment uh, by collecting and cleaning wastewater and recovering valuable resources for a healthy and resilient Puget Sound. The opportunity we have with this process is to look out uh, perhaps 50 years, maybe even a little bit further, to look at the system that we want not just ourselves to have, but what do we want our grandchildren and maybe even their children uh, to inherit. So um, the framing question that I like to repeat is, um, you know, ma imagine what's possible if we get this right. It's a wonderfully simple but somewhat deceptively simple question um, because it, it gives us an opportunity to do a little bit of blue sky thinking. If we really want to try to get our system right, uh, let's imagine that. Uh, but we also have to, to get it right. We have to make policy changes today to change uh, course if need be to try to get more to that. And that'll be a process where we want to have robust engagement from partner agencies like the city of Bellevue and, and the other 33 contract agencies from uh, NGOs, from Indian tribes, from our regulators to try to help us shape that future. So that'll be coming in a few years. And again, we'll be happy to come back and talk to you more about that process as we go forward. Um, as Director Rube mentioned, uh, we are also uh, building tools uh, to help us both with the annual sewer rate process and the 10-year forecast, but also tools that will help us with that long-range planning process. Uh, the our Regional Water Quality Committee uh, adopted two motions um, to guide development of these tools, and we've been meeting the deadlines in those motions. You can see, I won't go through all of this um, uh, material here, but we've been working to develop those motions. We're working a lot through um, the uh, MUPAC, the Metropolitan Water Pollution Abatement Advisory Committee, um, which um, city staff participate in, uh, and uh, we very much appreciate uh, the contributions of Bellevue, both with MUPAC and through the RWQC. Those are the folks that are helping us uh, create those tools. We've got a good consultant on board, so we'll be able to look out even further than the 10 years that we're doing now, uh, look out 20, 30, or maybe uh, longer um, as best we can through the development of those tools. 
So a few next steps here. Uh, the county executive did propose the rate that I mentioned to you here today, that 5.75% increase. That's been formally transmitted over to the county council. I believe that was last week. Um, and uh, the county council budget and fiscal management committee will consider this next on May 22nd. And then uh, the county council, who is the ultimate decision maker for this, will make a decision on the rate in June. Have to do it uh, no later than June 30th so that we um, uh, meet our uh, obligations under county code and uh, you can incorporate a known rate into your own rate process uh, for next year. And I believe with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for the time tonight. Great, thank you for that presentation. Um, let's start with Council Member Lee because he was on the Regional Water Quality Committee. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I want to first thank uh, our staff, utility staff, uh, uh, Lucy, uh, and also obviously for Ella Williams for supporting me in on the uh, Regional Quality uh, System uh, Committee at King County. So uh, I want to also thank uh, them to bring this issue uh, to the City Council, especially Mayor Robertson, and to put on the agenda for us to understand this is a very important, very critical and crucial issue. And so thank you, uh, Director Kuros. I appreciate what you have been, done, have been doing. Uh, you've always, you, since you joined the King County uh, Wastewater Treatment Division, you've been a very fresh air and very collaborative with all the you know, elected officials and all the stakeholders. So we appreciate that. Uh, I don't have any questions because I have been following all this. I've been brief on this stuff, so I'm pretty familiar. But I do have some comments so I'd like to perhaps make uh, for the benefit of the City Council and the rest of the public. Uh, because as you mentioned, uh, the cost and everything, especially with the increasing cost, it's going to be uh, on the back of the ratepayers. So they need to understand, need to know, uh, you know, whatever implication it means. Uh, so. Uh, as a, uh, you know, caucus chair of the Sound Cities and also the Regional Water Quality Committee's vice chair, uh, I've been working with you guys and looking at this specifically, especially on behalf of the City of Bellevue, because City of Bellevue is a major uh, uh, rate payer. Our uh, rate, utility rate, you know, uh, almost half of it, it's uh, based on the waste treatment division. So the increase that we're looking at is very substantial. Uh, so uh, I want to be sure that we all working collaboratively, uh, regardless of you know each city, because you have a lot of stakeholders. You have Water District, you have uh, MUPAC, you have other jurisdictions. You know They're all very much going to be affected by what's going to happen. So uh, this include guidance to WTD and feedback about wastewater in the long term. And I also appreciate the time that Mr. Guru and WTD staff have taken with the Regional Water Quality Committee this year under you know, uh, Council, Committee, Council Member Claudia Baducci to increase the visibility into the rates development process. This includes briefings earlier on in the year and additional information on the rate drivers and policy issues. I believe it's very important that decision makers can understand what goes into the rate. We must be able to provide clear information on how regional choices and costs impact Bellevue ratepayers. I think WTD is on the right track with the long-term forecasting work, and I look forward to continuing to engage with the staff and the committee uh, further to discuss industry best practices. The other big issue is the Regional Wastewater Services Plan, which you term RWSP update. I'm hopeful that Bellevue and other contract agencies will be able to guide that work and set priorities for the next generation of wastewater service. There are a lot of opportunities for partnership between Bellevue and the WTD, and I think we can work together to achieve our goal. I would welcome my colleagues, especially, uh, to uh, your thoughts, because I, I hope that you understand the significant importance of what we're talking about. 
and not just do some for wastewater treatment, but it affects clean water as well. We haven't talked about that yet, because if you don't have clean water, I mean, you don't have a good wastewater treatment system, it's going to affect climate, it's going to be uh, uh, under new regulation, and you're going to have a mess, and that includes the clean water. So I would welcome the, my colleagues' thoughts and pr perspectives on the issue presented tonight so I can ensure that Bellevue is well represented as I can continue my work at RWQC. So if the director has any additional information to share about uh, the RWSP update, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead with uh, council member questions. Council member Hamilton. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so I, I think this kind of long range planning um, I find very interesting. I'm on the board of the Cascade Water Alliance representing the city. So we do a fair amount of that kind of long range planning. Um, so I haven't been there very long, but just even the time that I have been there, it's uh, clear that uh, that kind of planning gives us more options to choose from. It's kept our supply safe, infrastructure strong, and, and rates down. And I think this same approach, I, I'm really glad to see it and, and some more attention paid to it uh, with the leadership from Council Member Lee and others and support from city and county staff um, increases our strength of our wastewater systems, supports our efforts to enhance and protect the environment, and provides our ratepayers with the explanations that they deserve. So I think it's important to share this kind of information with our uh, community members. We're talking about significant increases. Uh, there's no reason to sugarcoat that. Um, but, you know, projections are projections. So while I assume, you know, we have a sound methodology for creating these, um, you know, of course, along the way, we can uh, always manage towards the best possible outcome for our ratepayers. And then, of course, looking forward to the next steps uh, tonight. Uh, when appropriate with Director Liu and her team for preparing the letter to send to King County Council and outlining our position on implementing a long-term planning tool and completing the regional wastewater services plan as soon as possible. And then just one question for you. Um, just for the long-range capital forecasting methodology and rate forecasting tool that's under development, how are you planning to involve contract agencies like Bellevue in the review and recommendation process, and how do you plan to implement this methodology once complete? Sure. Um, well, there are, I think, um, at least a, a couple of different ways where the city of Bellevue can stay involved, maybe three. One is we're happy to talk directly with staff and at, at any time, and we're happy to, to uh, work with you and share the work that the consultants is, is going through and, and uh, answer Bellevue specific questions. Uh, two, uh, Bellevue has been a participant, and I believe will continue to be a participant in MUPAC. That's probably the single best place um, where um, people like Director Liu here, her peers, other utility managers, they're really um, got a lot of technical expertise that they can bring to bear on looking at the consultant work, uh, helping to guide that, um, asking good questions, making sure that assumptions are robust, the methodology is robust. We look across the industry for best practices, as uh, Councilmember uh, Lee mentioned. Uh, so as we develop the tool, I expect Bellevue to be right there with us um, to do uh, that work. And then third is at the Regional Water Quality Committee. This is uh, at their request that, that the tool be developed. We'll have to report back to them. So uh, they will have the opportunity to hear directly from whether it's staff, consultants, or, or, or our folks here at, at WTD on uh, the proposed tool, how it will work, um, and how it can benefit all of us. So I think there's multiple ways. Okay, and then as far as uh, how you plan to implement the methodology once complete? Well, we can implement it in a couple of different ways. Uh, we mentioned uh, both in the annual sewer rate process, there might be an opportunity to look out more than 10 years uh, with this tool. So, um, so I think that's a, a regular opportunity for it. And then I'm, uh, I'm most excited about how we can use the tool as a part of the uh, RWSP update, that long range plan. So uh, we'll be developing different policy options. Uh, the tool will help us to test some of those options uh, as we develop it. Uh, so uh, it's coming at a good time uh, as we get the plan started. Uh, developing the tool sort of as we launch the plan um, is a good thing. 
Uh, so I expect it to be a, a, a robust meth method that um, will help to build, you know, knowledge and confidence um, in some of the decisions that, that uh, are um, ultimately our elected officials like yourselves have to make. Awesome. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, Council Member Newenhouse. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, really appreciate the, uh, as my colleagues do, the presentation, uh, working with our city staff on uh, developing these long-range plans and long-term forecasting tools and implementing the RWSP update. Um, I'd be lying if I didn't say, though, that it's just very um, concerning, I guess, uh, I'm with, with top of mind being the rate payer. Um, and I just don't see how this is sustainable. I mean, every other week I hear from uh, residents that, and it's a compounded effect, right? It's it's not just this. It's it's uh, increase in property taxes, it's grocery bills, it's everything. Um, and I'm deeply concerned about the affordability of Bellevue, as all of us are going in the future when we're seeing, um, uh, you know, nearly 10% increases every year, a doubling of the rate in, within 10 years. Uh, again, I just don't see how that's sustainable, and um, and and I appreciate your comments about the grants, but is is that the only thing that we can look at in terms of reducing the 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 ratepayers' um, yeah, impact go, going going forward? And I I fully understand there's a lot of things that are outside of your control, and one of my questions is actually what um, you know. Specifically, what does a WTD? What can you control? What costs can you control? And and what have you done to try and lower those costs as 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 much as possible? Because again, I'm just really concerned about the lower taxpayer or the lower income folks in our community and and the middle class. You know, our firefighters, our police officers, our teachers. How is this sustainable? As much as we're trying to, you know, create affordable housing and 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 other things that we can do to maintain, you know, uh, we want people to stay here or move into this area. We've got all these other really higher costs happening all the time. So I'll, I'll stop with that and let you answer my my, my question. Yeah. We, we absolutely share that that same concern. Um, so first, we want to be transparent about what's driving it, um, so that we can all see uh, what's on the table. Our goal has to been to open up the hood, let you see what. We we see um, if we've got something wrong or we can do something better, mm -hmm. uh, we need um, all the eyes to help us to, to figure that out. So one is just being transparent. Um, two is to look to break down what those cost drivers are. And that, that bar chart that we showed was at least an attempt to try to do that. I mentioned the big three. Two of the big three are very hard for us to manage directly and really We do our best to influence, but we yep. don't have control. Yep. One is the regulations there, and two is the contract obligations. And so, so uh, assuming that those are... are uh, comparatively set and that we don't have a dial to turn we have a voice but not a not a hand on the dial mm -hmm. um, uh, I think we need to continue to use that voice um, uh, folks will know that, that King County was an appellant of the Puget Sound Nutrient General Permit because we felt it would impose very high cost obligations for modest benefits we are trying to get we want to we want to uh, manage for nutrients. We don't want to see nutrient impacts in Puget Sound, just like our regulators don't want to see those too. But we want to try to advocate for smart ways about uh, to achieve those goals that are more cost effective. So, so we are going to continue to do something as much as we can, even on the the parts of that bar chart where we don't have a direct control. We have a little more control over the asset management part. Um, but I'd say it's it's kind of like anyone who has owned an older home. You can you know defer investments, and you will probably deal with it later. Um, so, we, and what we don't want to do is to see a failure in the system right. uh, through no. uh, some kind. And we have parts of our system that are, believe it or not, older than me, and that's hard to do. Um, so you know, uh, we're we're you know our system is is sixty plus years old, um, yeah. a lot of it, and so you can and. What's going through the system is, is not nice stuff. It is uh, corrosive. And some of it is, you know, really difficult uh, to handle. So pipes and pumps and, and facilities do show age. So we want to try to make sure that we have as a robust a system as we can for the water quality benefits, for the public health benefits, et cetera. So we are making more investments in asset management. We're also trying to do it smarter. Um, we are advocating for those grants, and I would say that's where I would love to see the city's voice um, uh, in chorus with us. Mm -hmm. um, so as you 
uh, and I think you have a direct you know stake in in doing so because you'll have these rates right. um, uh, as you mentioned uh, so so I think more of a strong voice to say these are on the backs of local ratepayers. We're protecting water bodies that are really of national significance. We really should use national level resources, in my view, to try to help um, there. And I've appreciated leadership from the county executive and from Councilmember Balducci, yep. um, as I mentioned, was just in DC, echoing these comments with our congressional delegation to try to get that, that uh, stronger. There are some mo more modest ways in which we can um, help as well, and I'll just mention two very quickly. There are a few aspects of our system where we actually um, um, uh, uh, earn some revenue. One is our biogas sales. Um, South Plant was mentioned, that's where Bellevue's wastewater is going. Bellevue's wastewater is helping to generate biogas, which gets put back into the PSE grid, and we can earn um, a noticeable amount of revenue through putting that gas back into the grid once it's scrubbed. Um, so that's a really good thing. Uh, I wish it were at the scale of revenue to match the expenses, but it is something we're trying to grow. We're doing a biogas optimization program across the utility so we can grow that revenue even more. And finally, I mentioned we're trying to uh, uh, utilize best practices for contracting. Uh, so it's a very challenging contracting environment, as many of you uh, know out there. Costs are high. Sometimes you get single bids um, uh, for, um, for major projects. Uh, so we're doing our best to understand that market better. Um, uh, we are considering making changes in some of our contracting processes and contract language so that we can get better bid prices on that, on that work. Uh, so, and if we get better bid prices, that lowers the cost of the capital program and that, that translates back into the rate. So uh, it's top of mind for us um, and it's certainly a top of mind issue for the RWQC uh, where Councilmember Lee serves. Um, and I know throughout my side of King County government, the county executive, and I believe this is true for the council as well, we share that concern. So these are a few of the things we're doing and we'd be happy to hear more good ideas from you all as well. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that answer and, um, uh, you know, I appreciate your perspective constantly also reinvesting in the infrastructure or something that I think we share as a city as well with our director of utilities and the importance around that. Um, I, I would like to see in this, is in this letter, uh, just to, to some extent, if we could have, um, that it, it will be an initiative or it will be uh, the look at some concrete ways that we can reduce the rate payer burden in some even if it's a small way, um, I know. Again, there's there's certain things you you, you know you, you you can't control, and 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 some will have a limited impact. Um, but I think you've got seven up here that will be part of that chorus asking for those federal grants. I know staff will as well. Anything that we can do uh, to help, I think uh, we we would be on board on. But I I really like to see us continue to dig in and look for concrete ways to reduce the uh, ratepayer expense. But thank you again so much for your presentation. Thank you, sir. Councilmember Stokes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this is something that's very interesting to me. I was on the, uh, still on the Cascade Water Alliance uh, board. I was on there for about 10 years, I guess, and uh, very glad to have Dave uh, working with us. Uh, and also uh, have been uh, with Cascade Water Alliance for a long time, was chair for three years, and uh, We've and, and have also been involved with some conversations between Cascade Water and other water facilities with the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the wastewater division. And um, there are a lot of issues that um, I think we could, it would take a long time to work on these. And one of the concerns we have is, you know, we have a really good water system in, in Bellevue. Uh, and we look, at, I know about those rates, you know, the rates with Cascade and, uh, uh, the investment we've made with Cascade and all these things and put together and it's kind of astounding to come and see to have the percentage points and the jumps that we're making on the uh, wastewater division that is not men or, uh, not uh, been done in other areas it's certainly not with Cascade certainly not with the the, the water the suppliers of water uh, and their issues in the I mean in the past have been talked about in terms of the, the, 
the wastewater facility going into uh, Lake Washington and a separate uh, second facility and questions about all those things. So it's, it's kind of hard and it, you, you, you're at a disadvantage of coming and saying, uh, you know, this is something's very important. Uh, these are our rates and we're jumping this just a really uh, astound, outstanding or outstanding actually uh, charges and going up on that. And it, it is very difficult to look at that and say, how are the average people going to handle this going forward? So, you know, you, and you've, you've said, obviously, that this is something that's really a, a real problem. But it just, it's, um, there's a conversation that's going to take a lot longer than this, this short conversation. But uh, I, I would like to see us do more, have more conversation between the cities, between our wastewater and, and our, our water suppliers and organizations like Cascade and others to work with us because it's all about where the water goes and comes and that. And, and the lakes and all these other pieces. So it's a very complex system. But when you look at this, it's really hard to talk to people, average citizens, and say, your wastewater rate's going to go up. It's going to double and more in, in a short time period. It's, it's, and we've been talking about this for a long time. I mean, this is not a new issue. So, um, I, I, you know, we can't have this conversation right now. But... Uh, all I'm saying is that this is a very, very vital issue, and it's, it's really hitting hard, hard with uh, average people to deal with this. And we, we struggle with the, our water rates it's, the, themselves, and we want to kind of keep those as low as we can. So uh, I really appreciate your coming over, and I, I would like to have us, not just with committees or people here, have more conversations between us and the other cities but particularly Bellevue has a huge uh, stake in this. How can, we, how can we work on this to make it not be so uh, just, just going up so far? And, and I don't know, you, you, it's, it's good to say, okay, we can go out and we forget grants and things, but to a certain extent is how do we make the costs not be as, as much as it is now? Uh, and going out and getting grants and having somebody else pay for it for us is kind of, you know, one of those things that's difficult, too. So uh, I, I really appreciate your coming and talking about this and being very candid about it and put this before us. So it's a very important thing. And I know, Lucy, we're, we're going to work with you on this because it is important. And um, let's do have the conversations and, and include Bellevue in working on solutions to this or how we can make it work. So appreciate your coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I offer just a very quick comment? Um, yeah. um, one of the things that, that I try to talk about wherever I go to talk about this subject is that we are a regional system. And at any given time, you can find a project that might be in Bellevue or Seattle or Carnation or any, any of the different locations that, that we serve. We have projects that are have been finished up recently in the Lake Hills area here um, in Bellevue. We've got another one that, that spans across from North Mercer Island out into the Anatai area of Bellevue. It's also um, a project down on, on Coal Creek. Um, so, you know, when I come to a city council, I, I, I look at our portfolio and I sort of like, oh, well, here's a bunch of projects in Bellevue that the city might be interested in. And the good news is that I can often repeat that kind of list wherever I go, because investments get made across the system. And as a regional system, that's one of the sort of, I guess you call it a, a sort of a built-in part of the system, that, that at any given time, we may be making investments that a local jurisdiction uh, might see a direct benefit from, uh, because the system will be more reliable. Um, oftentimes, we'll leave a, a, a location in better shape. There's a Coal Creek project where we're improving uh, ADA access um, through the, the provision of the wastewater project. So there's little places like that where we can help make the community just that much better uh, with, a, with a local project. So there are ways in which I think value associated with this can be a little bit more also transparent um, to the ratepayers so that they could see some tangibility associated with that. We're happy to, to provide you with that information so that as you talk with your constituents, you're armed with, hey, there's these projects here in, in Bellevue. And it doesn't answer the rate 
concern question, but it at least adds to the conversation that there isn't just this sort of vague cost out there going towards something that I never see. Um, and that there's some tangibility to all of that. So, so that's one way I, I would hope to add to the conversation. And as I said, I could have that same conversation whether it's Bellevue or, or one of our other communities here because there's good projects going in from Auburn to Shoreline out you know, east and west as, as well. Um, and, uh, and really excited about projects here in, in Bellevue. Uh, we had Councilmember Balducci out to see a portion of the uh, project that's going across from Mercer <coughs> Island out to uh, uh, the Anatai area because there's underwater work going on through there. It's very delicate environmental work, has to be done right. To do that right adds to the cost, but we want to make sure that you know the fish are protected, the shoreline's protected, et cetera, as we go through that process. So, so that would be one of the ways I'd, I'd add to the, to the conversation. Thanks for the moment. Yeah, no, thank you. I think we would be interested in updates on projects in Bellevue. That's, that's sure. helpful. Council Member Zahn. Yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. And I want to start by appreciating the fact that this year you're keeping the rate flat. So we're talking about future years, but this particular one staying or uh, committing to with a number from last year when you came to us. And then also congratulations on the $500 million low-cost loan from EPA. I think those are the kind of things that we're gonna need to do to make sure that that funding is available. I can just appreciate the amount of uh, challenge that maintaining and replacing aging infrastructure looks like. As you said, a lot of this infrastructure has been in the ground for a long, long time. And then when I look at these slides, for example, slide number six that talks about the CIP, that doesn't even include potential nutrient or PFAS requirements. So when we look at that hill in front of us, it's a pretty steep climb to uh, deliver reliable and affordable uh, wastewater treatment on things that we don't exactly know, but we are continuing to follow and try to advocate for. So I just appreciate the thoughtfulness about looking at these rate increases and I would say that related to the long-term forecasting, I would strongly encourage well beyond 10 years, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, because we know that there is a replacement cycle for the infrastructure. And so to the degree that we can look ahead, I think that's really important. Um, I appreciate hearing from my colleagues. I think that on the delivery side, I've appreciated the fact that King County has been looking at innovations. I know that you know, you and I were at the D DBIA conference that was last year, and King County has been looking at alternative delivery as a way to better deliver um, in a more expeditious and at the right price to um, be really thoughtful with how we are going to use the money from our ratepayers. So I would say continue to do that. I mean, I see your staff attending training to make sure that they're always being better, and I appreciate that. I would say that for me, as I look at the graph on page six, I, I know that there's a lot of competing interest here, but I would really like to see resilience lifted higher because ultimately, as we look at more resiliency on our system, it's a holistically going to be a better cost overall. And so to that end, I'm also thinking about on the CSO consent decree pushing out to 2040 seems like cost escalation is just going to eat us for lunch. So I'm wondering if, as you look at your forecasting, actually trying to move some of these projects quicker, even if it means additional WIFIA loans or other ways to look at um, starting some of these projects earlier. It just seems to me that the longer we wait on some of these aging infrastructure, we know that has to be replaced, the more costly it might be. And absolutely, I would say that from the council to the degree we can add to our legislative priorities to advocate for the both more grants or a new grant program as well for overall building this infrastructure, as well as supporting our lower income ratepayers. I think it's a both and. And then lastly, I guess I'm really curious because we were on the trip together to Denmark mm -hmm. and learning about on the sustainability and heat recovery technologies. 
Is that something that you're also looking at from the standpoint that as we look at the infrastructure to the degree we can look at heat recovery for um, for electricity? I know we're talking about that in the Warburton area, but more broadly for King County wastewater, are you looking at those technologies that are a, we're spending some money, but we're getting more gains as a result? Could you comment on that? Yeah, I'll try to do it briefly, uh, and thank you for your leadership in that regard um, as well. I thought that the trip was illuminating in a lot of different ways, and we do have our, our sewer heat recovery pilot program that is um, in process right now. We have project number one that's um, uh, been built, and that's in the South Lake Union area. I would love to see another project um, in the city um, as well, so um, uh, looking forward to that partnership uh, uh, with you here. Um, uh, and so uh, we've got people that uh, continue to uh, uh, stay in touch with Denmark and other uh, countries where um, these kinds of technologies are, are being used. I've challenged our, our staff to um, take a, a little proactive attitude towards that. Uh, the, the pilot program is a bit reactive and I want to see what we can do to, to um, get the word out a little bit more aggressively and look for opportunities for deploying that, that technology. Um, it's exciting to see. I saw a little bit more of that when I was in DC myself not too long ago uh, with uh, DC Water using that same type of technology that we are using um, in, in South Bellevue. So, so it's available, it's out there, we should take advantage of it. Um, and you know, the, the simple, simple idea here is, you know, you wash a load of clothes in warm or hot water, that's heat that goes into the wastewater system. We want to try to capture that heat back out and use it in another beneficial way. It's just like any other resource. If it, if we don't capture it, it sort of drifts away. Um, so if we can find ways to capture that heat um, and put it to beneficial use, we want to try to do that. And that's part of that vision for the future is to do that even more. So we're definitely uh, trying to go um, uh, strongly into that resource recovery, and I think that's a great opportunity uh, for us to do that. And we've got other good examples. If you get a chance to go up to Vancouver sometime, um, on the UBC campus, there is uh, another deployment of that kind of uh, technology up there. So um, it's a great opportunity. Well, let's do a field trip. Thank you. Love to. Okay, Deputy Mayor. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for being here and hearing our concerns. Uh, I am also going to repeat my concerns about the proposed significant increases, especially considering the current and probably future economic climate. Three comments and questions. One is the follow-up of Councilmember Zahn. Is, has there been any studies uh, that sh shows the potential cost impl impl uh, implications more than 10 years from now? Uh, something that is more in future on the infrastructure, the climate change, impact or anything else that, that's what that tool is intended to do is to develop a, a methodology so we can do exactly that so we, we don't plus. we don't yeah 10 years plus so and as was mentioned i think the tool the the rwqc would like to see a tool that could go out you know well into the future they were talking about as far as 75 years the, the future gets very fuzzy i would say beyond a certain point um so we're guessing at some point but um the closer you get in um, it's much more of an informed guess, and that's why the tool is important so that we can make those informed guesses and estimates. Uh, so I expect to, to be able to do that within you know, a year or two here as we develop that tool. We have to report back with the final tool, I think it's July of 2025, so just over a year from now to the RWQC with the final tool. There will be milestones along the way um, as we go through the development of that. So you'll see that in, in, in place here in the in the coming um, couple of years. And as I said, I'm looking forward to using it, especially with our long range plan. It's a nice complement to the long range plan. So as we develop these different scenarios or alternatives, we can test them using that tool and each be able to look out, not just 10 years, but hopefully 30 or 50 years into the future. That's awesome, thank you so much. You uh, mentioned there are mainly three reasons uh, that drive yep. the increase uh, when Councilmember Newenhouse asked you. From last year prediction to this year prediction, what was the main difference and cause? Because yeah. your last year 
projection is completely different than this year projection. Yeah, uh, yeah. and to, so a, a couple of things I'll point to, and one actually is a, a partial response to Councilmember Rizan's question about our CSO obligations. So these are large regulatory obligations that we have um, to put in what are called CSO control structures. So. Uh, one, we're partnering with the city of Seattle now on a large storage facility. It's an underground pipe that can store wastewater um, during heavy rainstorms. And then if it's stored, then it doesn't overflow into, in this case, Lake Union or the Sip Ship Canal. It can store and wait till the rainstorm passes and then be uh, then uh, sent on its way to West Point Treatment Plant and treated and, and discharged um, like it's supposed to be. So uh, those are examples of the kinds of, of, of projects that we have. We have those projects in this next 10 years. Uh, we started putting those projects in a couple of years ago, and that's what started to push on those, that bar chart and make those bars get, get higher. Uh, we had held, um, and Council Member Zahn will, would be very familiar with this, but with any capital project, you usually have a contingency amount. Um, it's a larger amount in the early stages, and as the project proceeds, that contingency can be smaller. We'd held that outside of the 10-year period in the forecast. We've now put it inside the 10-year period because those, those costs may, in fact, get, get realized um, during that time. So that's part of that transparency is to sort of be honest with ourselves and then everybody else to say we may incur those costs that raises the bar chart and it raises um, uh, the, the cost. So that's an example of the kind of thing that ha was different between last year and this year, is that we've put those costs um, in. They were kind of always there, and we sort of held them off for a little while, not deliberately, but, but not, not to hide them. But we, we really need to show them uh, now because they're, they're properly shown in the years that are covered by that 10-year period. So that's bumping up some things. We've also had a few cost increases um, on projects that we've gone out to bid for that have come in higher than the engineer's estimate. Um, that's something that we and others are seeing these days. Um, I mentioned that a project that the city of Seattle did. They actually... Um, um, did their bidding process in two stages. When I went to bid the second stage, they got a single bid, and it was dozens of percentages higher than the engineer's estimate, so they called a timeout, rebid it. It's still higher than, than uh, what they'd like, but they managed to save, I think, probably a few tens of millions of dollars by doing that. That's important um, in this process. We want to try to, to uh, uh, follow that as, as best of, as we can uh, as well. So, so we will uh, continue to be as transparent as possible um, to show you what those costs are and when they're coming in. Um, and that's kind of what's changed between last year and this year. So am I right that you said two driver? One, the contingency stuff that was there, but you didn't, didn't bring it to it. the actual thing. Yeah. And the second thing is Some the construction costs overall went up. And those two main driver is a difference between the last year projection to this year projection. Yes, no, so two, two of the main drivers, exactly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And is this, because I didn't see that in the document, so this is part of a transparency. I haven't seen that. Was that in the document that we, you, you have shared with us? Um, those two items were presented to the RWQC, and so we have seen some additional information, but I think as with the long-term forecasting tool, we'll continue to get more clarity on that information, and so we're hoping that the work that WTD is doing now can continue to increase the That's transparency. That's awesome, because I love that you talk about transparency, and that would be awesome. And my last comment would be, I am very happy that you are thinking about alternative revenue streams. You mentioned mm -hmm. two of them. That's awesome. Uh, and, but I also wanted to see how can we do cost saving. And one of the cost saving I would I believe would be some incentive for our residents to kind of reduce and do water conservation. Have you thought about that? Maybe we can incentive our resident to, uh, I think PSC does that. Yeah. Uh, I applied for everything that they offered me to <laughs> reduce my electricity. Can yeah. we do the same kind of thing for... Uh, I'm not sure that model works as much with wastewater, but, um, but we are um, very much open to innovative thinking like that to see what we can do. I would say one of the things that comes to mind about what we can all do 
um, is um, put less bad stuff down the drain. Um, you've heard about things like the flushable wipes, which aren't flushable. Don't put those down the drain. They clog up the system. We have to go in and fix it. It costs money to deal with those kinds of things. That's a simple one. But other things that don't need to go down the drain, you know, unused medications, put them in the, in, you know, use the proper system to disposal instead of putting them in the toilet. Those kinds of things, the less things that we have to deal with at the, what's called the end of the pipe mm -hmm. uh, means the less in cost associated with, with doing that. So uh, the larger name for this is source control where we can, you know, and Council Member Zahn mentioned PFAS. This is the, one of the big things that's hanging out there. Um, if we can um, individually and in our homes and businesses use less chemicals that present a problem for whether it's the drinking water system, I know Cascade's been talking about this, or the wastewater system, uh, we will have to incur the toss of dealing with that even less. So don't use it and then we won't have to deal with it. Our systems weren't designed for those kinds of fancy mm -hmm. chemicals. They were designed to treat the biological wastes that go into the wastewater system. And they're very good at dealing with that kind of thing. So what they aren't good at dealing with is these forever chemicals um, that were designed to be in indestructible. Um, and they're very good at being indestructible. So if we can do less of that individually, as in our homes, in our businesses, then we will save ourselves all money um, today and over the long term. So that's the best answer I can give you for how we do Oh, that's awesome. Are that. you just get the education I needed. So I think that's the area that we can educate everyone on this topic that is a collaboration between the city and you all. Thank you so much for the presentation again. Thank you. So I agree with my colleagues. And um, I'm, I'm disappointed in a way because I was really hoping if we were going to invest this much in our infrastructure that we could come up with more uh, innovative, sustainable infrastructure to deal with wastewater, and it feels like we're kind of doing more of the same. Um, I share your desire for that. You and I have had that conversation uh, when we were in, in Denmark, and so I think the opportunity that we have um, is with that long-range plan to, to bend that curve towards more sustainable things. We're doing what we can even on the projects that we're doing today. There's a lot of energy conservation that we can achieve um, in projects, both generating energy and conserving energy, having more sustainable projects themselves today. I didn't get a chance to talk to you about that, but there are good examples um, of projects that are on that list today that will <coughs> yield really positive benefits. We talked about sewer heat recovery. Um, and I, I think there's, there's exciting possibilities um, down the road too with food digestion, other things where we can use parts of what is now a waste stream and put it to, again, beneficial use. So it is not off our radar at all. Um, what I would say is that projects like those CSO obligations, they, they, they are harder to get a lot of yield out of that in terms of the sort of resource recovery and sustainability. We do every, we're going to do everything we can to do that, but, but they probably fall into that more of the same category uh, as you would see it, and I might even agree with you. Um, so we're going to continue to look at those. Where I see opportunities are other parts of our system uh, where we can um, build really the system for the, for the future. So it is not off my radar, it is squarely in front of me right now to try to make sure that that does happen and it happens as broadly and deeply as we can get it to happen. Okay, well, I appreciate that response <laughs> and I would love to see that happen. Um, the the um, direction is to prepare a letter and I hear from the council that we'd like this letter to include looking at concrete ways to reduce the ratepayer burden looking at ways to utilize sustainable practices now and in the future, providing regular update dates regarding actual usage and population growth, as well as long range estimates and public education on how on all those things that you just told us on ways to reduce the cost of uh, treatment. So um, is it enough to kind of mention those things um, without putting those in the motion? Yeah, that's fine. The staff have to note that. I can't see who's talking. Okay, it's all right. Me. <laughs> okay, there's all these women. Okay, great. So let's go ahead and, and make a motion. 
I move to direct staff to prepare a letter to King County communicating the city's position concerning the proposed 2025 sewer rate, emphasizing the importance of implementing a long-term forecasting tool and completing the RWSP update. Second. All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you again. All right, let's go ahead and take a break. Yes. We'll come back at 8.10. Thank you. All right, we shall resume our next study session item. Um, Ms. Carlson, would you like to introduce this one? Thank you, Mayor. Um, Council, this is a presentation on our affordable housing strategy implementation, and you're gonna get it in two parts. The first is a review of the 2017 strategy and um, the um, accomplishments. And then the second part will be an overview with uh, background and, and information regarding um, setting the, the new targets for affordable housing. And um, joining from community development, we have Emil King, planning director, Linda Abe, and Hannah, I believe Hannah is also at the table, Bon Miller, senior affordable housing planner, and then we also have Nick Whipple from uh, Code and Policy Director from Development Services. So with that, I'll turn it over to Emil to begin the presentation. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Acting City Manager Carlson, and uh, good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and members of council. Uh, this is our twice a year uh, update on affordable housing. Um, affordable housing continues to be a top priority uh, for the city council and staff are happy to be here tonight to report on our progress and also bring forward a um, new uh, target for council consideration. The four of us here at the table uh, tonight represent a much larger team that is working on this priority and we are guided by the 2017 affordable housing strategy. Uh, tonight you're gonna be hearing about some acceleration we've been doing on a range of our current programs and also uh, you're gonna hear from Nick about uh, initiating some new tools through the next right work uh, to ultimately put more affordable housing in place. The, um, the focus on affordable housing is just a reminder, it's to those earning less than 80% of the area median income and this translates to uh, 94,000 annual income for a two person household and we, we talk about a 30% in my household of two, that's 35,000 that they're earning uh, per year. Um, I did wanna, uh, just as we reflect back on our accomplishments, I wanted to note that the city does not do this alone. We have many partnerships that deliver affordable housing. I just wanted to mention a few of those partnerships. Um, we have a great partnership with Arch to help look for funding of projects and the whole range of uh, funders, funders and funding options that are out there. The development community through the land use incentives and the MFDE program are a, are a big partner. Our partner agencies such as Sound Transit and King County Housing Authority, and also the nonprofit developers and operators of uh, many projects in Bellevue. The faith-based properties are now uh, very interested, a, a handful of them in actually doing affordable housing on their sites. And we also have the advocacy groups that are uh, great partners as well. And to wrap up, the business community has been essential in this work, especially I wanna mention the, the uh, funding and loan options that have come forward from entities such as Amazon and the Microsoft Corporation. So tonight we have uh, two parts. The first part is our twice a year uh, informational update. We will not be uh, seeking direction on the, on the first half of the presentation. And then we will in the second half shift in to focus on establishing a new city of Bellevue affordable housing target and we will be asking for a council direction on that. The overall agenda, we'll start uh, with the uh, affordable housing strategy first. You'll hear from a number of staff on that update and then we will uh, pause uh, and then move on to the affordable housing uh, target section of the presentation. brief than we, we usually do, but I'm gonna just go ahead and do a quick. Move forward. There we go. So nearing the end of the seventh year of the adoption of the affordable housing strategy, we can see 
that the five strategies and the 21 actions of the implementation plan have served as well. The combined total of affordable units currently in service or in the development pipeline has surpassed the original target of 2,500 new or preserved affordable units over a 10-year time frame. Um, last fall, you asked us to start looking at the target, and that's why um, towards the end of um, our presentation, we'll be talking more about the target. Um, by, use, by utilizing the 1,899 figure for in-service units and excluding the shelter beds, re it reveals that over a seven-year period, the average annual production rate of affordable units is approximately 270 units per year. Um, this rate of production um, could not have been done without the actions of the implementation plan, but, and we have pretty much used all 21 actions. So as we look at the target, I think it's important to also look at what are our options for providing more uh, tools so that we can increase the uh, production level of our affordable housing. I also wanted to point out that of, uh, of the total number of um, units that were pr produced, 1,245 of those are actually preservation units. So over a little bit under half have been through the preservation of existing multifamily rental properties that are affordable without public subsidy to households earning 80% AMI or below. And the majority of these preservation units since 2017 have been through the King County acquisitions of these properties. So this is a big, big part of what our production was last year. So we really need to think about how we are going to be able to do that moving forward. So I just want to highlight a few of the accomplishments since the last update. Um, the opening of the Polaris in the fall, uh, we reported that the 100-bed porch light men's shelter in Plymouth Crossing supportive housing had opened. Both are now at 100% occupancy and provide housing for people with incomes below 30% AMI. The final stage of the Eastgate campus is the Polaris development, which opened um, the first building in March and is already fully leased. The second building is expected to receive a certificate of occupancy in May with move-ins beginning June 1st. This development brings a total of 360 housing units affordable at or below 60% AMI. We also want to note that the Bellevue School District obtained a master lease agreement with the Polaris development developers to, pre to reserve 50 units for teachers and staff. I also want to point out that this, this project is very family friendly. A high percentage of the units are two and three bedrooms. And so I think, and then there's also will be a daycare center that will be part of the development as well. Wow. Let's see. The other milestone was that Bridge Housing, um, the housing developers for the 120th Spring District TOD project, that's the Sound Transit TOD site adjacent to the operations and maintenance facility, hit, us, hit a milestone recently by securing 100% of their funding for their 234 unit project and construction is set to start in the fall. Amazon's significant financial contribution coupled with the funding from the Housing Stability Program really helped Bridge achieve this funding milestone. And lastly, the uh, Affordable Housing Strategy C1 program. Staff continues to engage with faith-based organizations interested in utilizing the C1 land use code amendment to develop affordable housing on their properties. We've talked to maybe six different churches. Of the six, three of the six, three are actually moving forward. So St. Peter's, I think you've all heard about that project. They are in the process of selecting a developer to build up to 100 units on their property. Um, Habitat for Humanity is continuing their work on the Holy Cross property. And we've been talking with Jubilee Reach to help them work through the process of planning for as many units as they can get onto their property. And they intend to keep their community services along with the housing that they want to produce. So we're really excited about the different churches that have been coming forward with this program. Thank you. 
Another accomplishment we'd like to highlight is Council's action in February to approve funds through the City of Bellevue's Housing Stability Program and Arches Housing Trust Fund. The Arch Housing Trust Fund is a long-standing program to provide capital funding to affordable housing across the east side, of which the City of Bellevue is a key funder. The Housing Stability Program, on the other hand, is a Bellevue-specific program that is in for its fourth year of implementation and provides capital and operating maintenance and services fundings to projects in Bellevue. As part of the February 2024 awards, $1.3 million was awarded to five projects through the Arch Housing Trust Fund, and almost $15 million was awarded to three Bellevue projects as part of the Housing Stability Program. The Housing Stability Program and Trust Fund have synchro synchronized allocation processes that you can see illustrated on the screen. These are annual processes, and both fund sources are going to release another request for proposals this summer. Review will happen in the fall and winter between September and December, and all awards do go to council before, uh, for review and approval before contracting and monitoring, and that will happen early next year. Um, developer engagement on these fund sources is ongoing, and we continue to make improvements to better solicit responses in applications for these funds. One such improvement this year was releasing a notice of funding availability prior to releasing our RFP this year, and this helps generate interest in a pipeline of projects who are ready to apply in the summer. Other ongoing work that relates to affordable housing includes a significant body of work related to the Comprehensive Plan Periodic Update and Wilburton Vision Implementation. A full draft Comprehensive Plan was recently released to the public on May 2nd, which was a great milestone. Um, and as part of that, uh, there were significant updates to the housing element, and the plan really focused on increasing overall housing supply, increasing the diversity of housing types within our community, and increasing affordability across the city. And through our public engagement, we've heard significant interest in the housing portions of the plan. The Wilburton Vision Comprehensive Plan Amendment was recently um, recommended by the Planning Commission, and it will be coming to the Council in late June. Um, there is ongoing work as part of the Land Use Code Amendments um, that will be discussed as part of the next right work item. Also notable is our continuing administration of our multifamily tax exemption program. Um, this has resulted in a pipeline of projects that are currently in various stages of entitlement and construction. Uh, we continue to hear interest from developers in utilizing this incentive for affordability, and we anticipate a growing pipeline um, through that incentive. And lastly, for me, I want to highlight our ongoing work to assess uh, surplus public lands for affordable housing. Um, our team is currently evaluating a public site in Wilburton and continues to think about the use of other public properties in Bell Red and beyond. And I'll hand it over to Nick for next right work. Thank you. Um, so uh, as Council is aware, in July of 2022, you all reviewed a list of housing strategies called the next right work. Um, the list included unfinished strategies from the 2017 affordable housing strategy and additional strategies to encourage housing production increase the amount of affordable housing within the city and minimize procedural impacts to building housing. Uh, the council selected five main actions and those are listed here. Um, the highlighted items are those actions that are still underway. The ones with the, the check uh, boxes completed are um, actions that you all have adopted. So with the next right work objective to increase housing production and expand opportunities for affordable housing, um, the floor area ratio phase two work and the Wilburton vision implementation are um, uh, two items that we'll be looking at ways to increase the supply of affordable housing uh, with the up zones that will be happening for those areas. Uh, and the approaches that we are exploring is a voluntary or a mandatory affordable housing program approach. You could think of the voluntary as a way to incentivize affordable housing, and the mandatory uh, approach would be to require affordable housing. Uh, so we are in the process of completing an economic analysis and stakeholder engagement to inform this work, and we'll be advancing recommendations on an affordable housing approach for Wilburton to the Planning Commission in the summer, um, and staff recommendations for the phase two FAR increase, um, which is that citywide approach for mixed use areas. Um, that's planned for uh, discussion with the Planning Commission in the late summer and fall timeframe. 
Uh, and so I'll turn it over to Emil now. So that completed the information only section of the presentation. We're now gonna shift into talking about the starting point affordable housing uh, target uh, moving forward. So as was mentioned earlier, um, we are on track to exceed the 2,500 units over 10 year uh, target that was set back in 2017. And as was identified early um, in 2023, a new target is needed and was desired by the city council for consideration. Um, targets are an important uh, tool to set a clear goal on what the city and partners hope to achieve. Um, tonight we are seeking confirmation on the approach we are using to, to think about a target and also seeking the, the specific direction from council on what we're calling our starting point uh, target. As we walk through the approach and methodology, you'll see some details of the starting point target and we'll also identify some of the next steps. Uh, this did start in earnest back in October 2023 when we talked to you about the overall approach we were gonna use to establishing a new target. Um, tonight we would like to uh, seek some direction and then as we look forward, we'd like to engage the uh, range of stakeholders out there uh, regarding the, the starting point target and some of the new tools that might be used to achieve it. And the stakeholders include uh, developers, nonprofits, community members, and others interested uh, in our affordable housing work. Um, and then in the fall, we would like to return back to council. Um, this is a starting point target, as we mentioned, and the council would have the ability uh, to, to modify uh, that uh, target based on uh, some of the tools that we do look into between now and then. The city established our original housing target as part of the 2017 affordable housing strategy with the intent to guide the implementation of that plan. A new target is to help staff to continue to implement our plans, to continue to be able to evaluate our programs, and to identify the tools and resources needed to meet that goal. The starting point for a new 10-year target was based on our growth target of 35,000 housing units over a 25-year period, and we took a 10-year increment of that growth. And that 10-year increment equals 14,000 housing units over that 10-year time frame. Uh, to estimate the need for affordable housing within that overall total, um, and as you'll recall, affordable housing, we're talking about income restricted units making, uh, for those making under 80% AMI. Uh, we calculated the need for housing at, um, affordable at different income bands based on a methodology that was utilized in the city's 2022 housing needs assessment. Based on that distribution of need calculated in that gap analysis, about 40% of our total growth will need to be affordable to those making under 80% AMI. The results of that methodology are illustrated here. Uh, you can see that a total of 14,000 units is needed in that 10-year period, and 5,700, or 40% of those, will need to be affordable to those making under 80% of the area median income. An additional 8,300 would need to be market rate units. Sub-targets are estimated as part of that 5,700 for zero to 30, 30 to 50% and 50 to 80% of the area median. And as stated, this distribution of affordable housing need reflects the approach that was utilized within the City of Bellevue's 2022 housing needs assessment gap analysis. And within that approach, we looked at both of our, both our current and future needs and representing um, the socioeconomic characteristics of three different groups, those who live in Bellevue now, those who work in Bellevue now, and those who live in King County and would like to live in Bellevue. Um, and based on that distribution of need, um, we applied that to the 10-year period and came up with the figures you see on the screen. Um, and the result is that about 19% of our total need will need to be affordable to the lowest incomes at zero to 30% AMI, 10% at 30 to 50% AMI, and 11% at 50 to 80% AMI, totaling 40% of the growth or 5,700 units in a 10-year period. Um, this discussion of sub-targets is important because that we know that generally different income um, bands need different types of support to produce affordable units. The highest level of generalized support is needed at the lowest income level of zero to 30%, which is depicted on the left side of your screen. 
And these projects almost always need capital and operating funding to produce these deeply affordable units and provide ongoing services. This funding can be private, philanthropic, public, including federal, state, or local dollars. And frequently projects are utilizing a combination of these sources to be able to um, achieve the needed capital and operating subsidy. At the 30 to 50% AMI affordability range, still a high level of generalized support is needed. These projects uh, require capital funding to bring units online, and they often need the operating subsidy as well to, in order to achieve those ongoing services. Above 50% AMI, land use and tax incentives generally can be an effective tool to produce units at this level of affordability. And above 80% AMI, typically the market can support those units. So by and large, we just want to emphasize that deeper levels of affordability do require more investment and that in, in general, incentives like land use and tax um, incentives are most effective at producing units above 50% AMI. We also wanted to highlight some additional metrics that can be considered as part of a target. Um, as discussed, we did already calculate these sub-targets for different area median income bands um, for the extremely low, very low, and low incomes. Um, other metrics that could be used to guide an affordable housing target are um, looking at tenure, so looking at the distribution of renter versus owner-occupied units produced. Um, another metric would be establishing thresholds for units created through new construction versus preservation. Um, also establishing a goal for family-sized units created or looking at the distribution of affordable housing across our community. Um, another metric could be established for emergency housing units in addition to our new housing target as we know this is an area with considerable need. As we look at this uh, starting point target, we do want to take a data-driven approach to figure out what it's going to need to achieve a, a new affordable housing target. Uh, this graphic right here shows our average production since 2017 through all of our programs for income-restricted uh, units and the work of our other uh, partners in the community. Um, this shows that for all units below 80% uh, AMI, we have produced on average 271 uh, units over the past uh, seven years. Um, as we look out over a 10-year period with this starting point target, it would be on average 570 units uh, per year. So it is uh, more than our previous uh, target. On the lower half of the, the graphic, we break down the 271 and 570 into the three uh, AMI levels that, that make up that zero to 80. You can see that we've been having um, good production at the 50 to 80 percent uh, AMI level, especially through land use incentives and the multifamily tax exemption program. Um, it is important to note in the zero to 30, 30 to 50, we, we uh, do show significant need in the community in those AMI levels with an important note that those do require significant outside funding and assistance to actually achieve those units. So as we talk about next steps, um, we would like to um, begin some outreach and engagement with stakeholders regarding the starting point target. We do wanna look into additional tools and the amount of funding that uh, would be needed to achieve the, the target, especially at the lower AMI levels. And we do plan to return to council in the fall to uh, get additional input from the council on our starting point uh, target. And then also looking forward into the fall as we wrap up the city's work and the council's work on the overall city comprehensive plan, we would like to launch an effort to update our 2017 affordable housing strategy. So that's looking at the, the actions that then would comprise our uh, strategy uh, moving forward. So um, I'd like to hand it back over to you, Mayor. Just a reminder, the first half of the presentation was information only, and then we are seeking direction on the starting point target. Okay, so you're looking for feedback on the actual target that you're proposing and on the process and approach to creating that target. Yes, Mayor. Um, so I'm going to start us off here. Um, the data, when I look at the data, what it shows me is that at the 50 to 80% AMI level, the incentives are working, like the MFTE program and others. So that's great. That's really good news. 
Um, and where we have been really intentional with our affordable housing land use codes, it's working in downtown and Bell Red, and we just haven't done um, the other parts of the city as much as we're, we plan to yet. I see that the C1 applications seem to be working. We've got one going uh, with Holy Cross, and we've got a few others looking at that, so that's really hopeful. And it shows that housing preservation provides the largest number of affordable units per project. So that's, you know, we're really being reliant on that. And so um, I have a few questions here. Um, first, I'll just say I do agree with the target that you've proposed, and I do agree with the process for achieving, for um, creating that target. So I'm yes, yes on that. But my questions are, um, first of all, are we reliant on the King County Housing Authority for housing preservation, or do we have other partners who we can do that with? Uh, right now, we, we are... Uh, you know, primarily relying on partnering with um, uh, groups like King County Housing Authority. So they re the a recent example was the Illahi Apartments, where KCHA and Amazon Co Amazon and the city did partner for preservation. Um, King County Housing Authority does go do their own preservation uh, by themselves as well. Um, there may be opportunities in the future to partner with others on uh, preservation. So that might be a new body of work that we want to note where additional staff time and, and um, uh, due diligence can be done for those other preservation opportunities. I just, because it's so, it's so impactful, I would like to make sure that we have other partners than just one doing that kind of work. So if we can look into that. <clears throat> um, second one, uh, can we use $50, $90 to fund zero to 50% AMI housing? Uh, uh, um, housing stability program slash fifteen ninety funds may be used up to sixty percent uh, AMI by okay. state law. We do have a a preference for zero to thirty, but but the law does allow it to go up to sixty percent AMI. Okay, well that's really hopeful. So if we ch chose to bond those dollars, we could generate more funding for that level of affordability. So that's something to think about. Um, are we doing anything with pre-approved plans for DADUs like Kirkland has done, or is that something that we're planning to do? Uh, yes, Mayor, that is something that we are planning to do. Uh, we'll need the rules in place first, but uh, Development Services is, is positioned to um, get that program on online. Okay. And then the last question is, has any developer taken advantage of MFTE with very small dwelling units? like micro-housing? Yeah, we are seeing, a, there's one project in Bell Red, and then the, the project in downtown, I can't recall, it's on 106. Those will be small units. So, in, uh, Mayor, just to clarify, interest in the, the MFT, but no, there are no completed uh, projects yet, but there is interest in those new provisions that we put in place. Okay, great. Okay, so just to kind of put all of this in perspective, the cost between 1980 and 2022, the cost of living has increased 140%. And during that time, housing prices have increased over 300%. The average salary has increased 18%. And, you know, we are way behind in our housing production, but we're also facing kind of a crisis of how on earth are people able to afford housing if their salaries aren't reflective of the increasing costs of living. So I just, I'm just saying that to the world because I think we need to all have an awareness of that. And, and here's the real kicker. The average CEO salaries have increased 1,300% during that same amount of time. So it just kind of puts it all in perspective. There's a lot of things we can do as a city, but there's a lot of things other people can do also for the community and for society. So that's just my little soapbox. Okay, Council Member Stokes. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, first, uh, first off, this is, this is a very amazing presentation, what you put together. I mean, I was 
you really did a great job on this, and it's uh, it's very comprehensive. Uh, I, I think the goals we're looking at are very good, uh, and, and and the mayor just said, you know, what the the real issues and problems are, and we can't solve those, unfortunately, and we're we're faced with having to do something that is. Uh, trying to make up for something that society has uh, kind of messed up. Uh, but uh, I'm very pleased that we, you know, we, we looked at this back in uh, 2017, and uh, the whole idea was that, uh, you know, we needed to do something about this, and we needed to put our strategy in place. We don't, as I said, you know, we, we, we don't have a plan. Plan something you put on, you go on that, but put in place the strategy, and I'm very pleased to see where that's what we've honed in on because that's what makes it work. Um, I, I think it's set out very well. My only question, and I really want to nail this down because we've been talking about this for some time, is the, the, who, who, who are we actually talking about? There are two different groups here. Um, and where the, say, 14,000 or 5,700 um, are they coming from, are they people who out there need housing, don't have housing? Or are they people who are living in a house now but may need housing two years from now? And I think the problem is I'd like to see us separate that out and understand that um, if somebody is in, if we have 100 people out and they don't have housing, you have 100 people who are in uh, right now, uh, some building have a housing, and so you have 100 people without, uh, you know, without that are not housed, and that's that should be our goal. You have 100 people who have housing, and we don't put them as a goal. Now, if they don't have, if, if the building, they, they get turned out and they don't have housing, that makes it 200 people we have need housing, not having these people replace or, or the, the, uh, if the, if the 100 people that got put out come in and have housing, then we say we met our goal. And you have 100 people sitting over here still needing housing. So it has, there's two separate things. And we need, need to do both of those. And we need to work to preserve housing every place we can. Because if we don't, these people will then be added to a number of people who are houseless, don't have houses. And I think that's where it gets a little bit, and, and we just can't do it by going around and finding out if somebody, you know, is uh, tearing down the house or whatever, and we add these to the numbers and work with them. We need to work with them, but we can't put them ahead of then people who have been sitting out here for a long time. All I'm saying is this, those are two different things, and we need to have a goal. We need to have clearly, any time we can replace housing, if, it's, if they get turned out, that is great. We need to do that and keep them from, uh, you know, going homeless. But we still have to look at the people who are now homeless. Uh, does that make sense in terms of what we're trying to do? Yeah, uh, Councilmember Stokes, thanks for uh, uh, talking a bit about the complexity of the housing need out there. Mm -hmm. So we did, we have a very thorough um, City of Bellevue housing needs assessment <clears throat> that does go into those different categories. So there's there's people that are unhoused right now. Mm -hmm. There's those that are severely uh, cost burdened when you're right. paying more than 50% of your income on housing. And there's people who may be housed now that the rents go up and there is an issue in the future. So I think it's a good reminder that this is a complex situation we right. have and housing affordability is a dynamic thing. Mm -hmm. um, as we ready for our engagement uh, this summer, we can distill down that um, housing needs assessment so the the general public is, can can understand it more fully, and then we can report back to you in the fall with some details about our, our needs in the city. Yeah, okay. But, I mean, I just want to make sure that we don't kind of somehow lessen our uh, target and what we actually accomplish because of the way we frame these two pieces. Yeah. And there are, are also going to be people coming homeless that aren't homeless now. So, But uh, anyhow, I think that aside from that, and I think we can work that out, but... I, I'm really impressed. I'm very pleased very much. Uh, we put a lot of work into it in, in 17, and uh, we, I'm glad we actually got our goal eventually. Uh, 
but uh, this is this is a culmination of work that this council and the staff have all worked and, and people on the outside with us too work together and I'm just very very proud of this in terms of how we're doing this and putting it together this is this will be this will be the best system I think around us but that doesn't matter because what matters is we're going to get people and, and housed so I'm, I'm all for this thank you thank you council members on in your comments please include if you are good with the goal and the process of achieving it too Thanks. certainly mayor well first of all thank you for all the accelerated efforts and really appreciate all the partners um, I was on the Experience Bellevue bus tour on Saturday where there was a lot of interest in learning about affordable housing in Bellevue. So uh, first of all, I, as, I support updating our affordable housing strategic plan. I might encourage us to call it an implementation plan or an action plan. So it's not just about strategies, it's truly about implementation action. Um, I appreciate the thoughtful recommendation and support the 5700. Although I do want to confirm, I believe in reading the packet, it does not include shelter beds because in past presentations, I think shelter beds were included, but the 5700 does not include um, emergency shelter beds. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. We will be um, uh, planning for and tracking those um, as, as a complementary effort. Okay, yep. that's good, because I think it's really confusing when we talk to the community about housing and we count shelter beds. They are not um, stable housing. It is really a space for people to come in out of the, out of the cold and, and get stable. And then I really appreciate the, the discussion about uh, new versus preservation, because when I think about the you know 1245 units that we preserve that's great that's the naturally occurring affordable housing however we i think we really need to be tracking the preservation and the new separately because um, if we are preserving that's great but we're not actually gaining at that point so i guess i would like to better understand when we say 5700 can we um, also set some some additional goals or sub goals that says of the 5,700, is that new units plus preservation or they're both commingled together? So I'm not saying I have the answer right now. I just think we need to talk about that. Well, I would ask staff to kind of explain the value of preservation because oftentimes those are units are about to be sold and will no longer be affordable so can you talk about the value of housing preservation to the affordable so, housing so mayor I, i'm not discounting preservation i'm just asking whether the 5700 um, is the right number as we think about new versus preservation being commingled in it so I, I i understand the value of that i just wonder if we're also trying to increase increase holistically housing. So that was really part of my the genesis of my question. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, Councilmember Member Zahn. We will be coming back in the fall and the, the additional metrics that uh, Hannah outlined, we are gonna have some thoughts on how those would apply to the, to the 5,700 uh, 5, uh, target units. Okay, so a couple of other comments. Really like the, the suitable public lands. It sounds like we're then going back and looking at the C1 that was intended to also look at public lands so that I would encourage us to both look at city owned as well as other uh, public agency owned lands as part of that. And then affordable ownership. So is that 57 only rentals or does it also include home ownership units? I think that's an important piece that I just like us to understand. I would strongly encourage us to bond against 1590 money if we actually do find development that's ready to support as well as potentially other options for investments, especially at the below 50% and below AMI. Um, my, my one comment and then one question is I had heard when I was at the Women Build last weekend with the uh, Habitat for Humanity that Although Amazon's loans are supporting different affordable housing um, sizes, that Microsoft only will fund units that are 100 units or higher. 
I think that might be worth doing some advocacy to see if those uh, lower number of units Microsoft would also be willing to look at, because I understand Amazon is doing that, but not Microsoft, and that is a very important piece of the, of the tools in the toolbox. And then um, to the mayor's point about micro units, I guess I'm just wondering of all the different things we've looked at, micro units, um, ADU conversions, um, can you talk about how successful some of these tools are? Uh, Linda, do you want to mention some of the interest we're getting in the in the micro apartments, just as an example of a new tool and how new tools do take some time to to get some traction? But yeah, we have some really yeah. interest. Yeah, we have. I've actually talked to a couple of developers who have been doing micro units in Seattle, and because we've made some changes to the MFTE, they're now interested to come um, into our market. So I think they see the the potential here because we don't have that type of housing. Competition isn't there, so and I think the other thing that they're looking at is being near uh, light rail stations, because typically they tell me often they can't build the parking. It won't work if they have to build parking to go along with it. And I know that with our codes, I think we're at 0.25. Is that correct? Yeah. So that okay. will be something we have to work with them. Thank you. On. And then the affordable the home ownership. Uh, home ownership would be part of the 5,700. What we do want, we do want to come back to council, and um, if we want to set a sub target of that uh, 5,700, that is for uh, home ownership, that would be a, a additional level of detail that we, I think would be good. Yeah, I'd like us to look at that, and then hopefully, if we can, maybe nudge Microsoft a little bit on the number of units. Thank you. Okay, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much uh, for a great presentation. Thank you the Community Development Department, Development Services Department, all of our other partners, and also this body, the, this council, the mayor, the previous council members that they have been here. Uh, it shows the hard work and dedication uh, for implementing the affordable housing strategy and we achieved we exceed the previous 10 years target of 2,500 affordable units. That's a significant achievement. So uh, I think we should celebrate that and um, we should rec recognize that. So thank you so much for that. Uh, really like the preservation of 12, 1245 units. Uh, as I think the whole has been mentioned, the lower acquisition costs, uh, reduced construction costs, um, time saving, community benefits is huge on those. So I think we should buy a lot of them. Uh, I think we had a finance workshop that we learned we can use debt. Uh, so I think that's a perfect example that a city should use debt uh, and try to buy these kind of uh, older building that is going to be sold to a developer and become a very new uh, and not affordable, and I think we can take advantages of those. Love the churches. Three churches are doing uh, something meaningful. I encourage us to kind of encourage more churches that we can use those lands for affordable housing. Um, so to I totally align with the number, the fifth, uh, 5700 and the process that you guys have. I really encourage you all to do a very comprehensive engagement with all of our stakeholders that you are going to do. Uh, and that, I think, would be the key of having a successful new goal that we have for the next 10 years. Thank you so much. OK. Um, Council Member Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> thank you uh, for the presentation and all the hard work. And I'll echo some of the previous comments. but. Just going through this material, I was very impressed, of course, with what's already been done and what it's produced, but then your thoughts on how we move forward. And uh, obviously, this is a really critical issue for the city is building out our housing supply. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased that you come here twice a year to give us an update, so thank you for making sure that happens. Um, again, I mean, this work is, is really solid. So, I mean, not only are we um, exceeding the goals we've already set, but you've laid out a really strong set of suggestions uh, for how we move forward. Um, 
and to, so achieve some, to achieve some more aggressive goals. So I think that's great. Obviously, uh, you know, this is a huge challenge uh, for the city, but I think what we're seeing tonight really makes it all the more clear. And I think, again, this uh, updated roadmap is really going to be uh, really important. And so um, I think uh, I look forward to when you come back uh, in the fall. And I think, you know, I see us kind of moving from what it was really ambitious to, to what's aggressive. And I think we, we need to do that to achieve these uh, bigger goals. Um, so just a couple of questions for you. Um, there was some uh, mention in the agenda memo that indicates work is underway to evaluate effectiveness of mandatory and incentive-based zoning in certain districts around the city. And uh, I'm not seeing the conversation amongst our outside stakeholders uh, gain much traction find that kind of frustrating, actually. So I'm just kind of curious if you could share some insights uh, into the analysis that you're conducting around uh, mandatory versus incentive zoning. Nick, do you want to start off? I'm <laughs> sure I can start yeah. off. <laughs> uh, thank you, Council Councilmember Hamilton, for that question. So um, as we were noting in the presentation, um, we are looking to um, test kind of the effectiveness of, of either approach in a few areas. Uh, Wilburton as one of those kind of next opportunities where we're seeing a, a pretty significant increase in the allowable density or increasing that development capacity there and trying to determine the best way to um, capture back some of the value that's generated through that uh, change in development capacity and um, how we can kind of use some of that um, as a affordable housing as the public benefit that we're targeting. So um, the other areas in our mixed use areas where we're increasing the floor area ratio for residential development, um, that was initiated uh, initially to uh, make residential development more competitive in those areas where land is competing with office uses. Um, we are also, because of the up zone that might be happening in those areas, looking at uh, a voluntary or a mandatory uh, approach there. Um, it's a it's a really complex topic. We are in the process right now, um, as mentioned earlier, on doing an economic analysis. Uh, we'll be determining kind of what the, the feasibility of, of these approaches might look like. Um, this is also requiring extensive engagement with our stakeholder community. We'd like to make sure we're all kind of understanding the same numbers. Um, we'd also want to make sure that the inputs that we're putting into building these models are vetted. Uh, with the development community in particular as they have experience with building um, housing and affordable housing. Um, so th the process though is going to be um, uh, involving those communities as well as our consultant team um, which includes um, community attributes as the economic analysis lead for both of those projects and then the engagement with the planning commission uh, over the summer and into the fall uh, to really kind of work through uh, what the, the right approach would look like uh, for these areas when pairing it with the up zones. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about the process. Emil, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, we've been, we've been spending the, the past few months working with the consultant. Uh, the same consultant is working on the citywide analysis and the Wilburton specific analysis. Um, we're starting to ramp up the engagement with the range of stakeholder groups out there. So the hope is that you'll hear more positive feedback from our stakeholders about our our open process that we are running. We wanna make sure that we hear all the voices, that we do sound economic analysis, and we're able to bring some options back to council for your policy consideration. That's great, that sounds very encouraging. Um, on the uh, slide 14, um, and looking at these 5,700 uh, units, um, are any of those you know, how would you kind of characterize those? Are any of those stretch goals? Um, and is it possible to pot, to stretch in one of those areas, possibly more? Uh, as we noted on the, um, the slide 17 that showed our production over the past uh, seven years, uh, the zero to 30 and 30 to 50, I think staff would consider stretch goals. It's gonna take a lot of uh, new thinking, new partnerships, new money, frankly, uh, to achieve those. So if I was going to highlight where we're really stretching, it is the 0 to 30 and the 30 to 50. Right. And what about the 50 to 80? Is that a goal? Is that a stretch as well? Or is that maybe one of the targets we could 
scratch a little more on? Uh, that's one when we're looking at our data-driven approach to this. We have been seeing some uh, good results uh, through our recent program, so we are going to look into that one a bit more. And um, if if council would like to um, increase the starting point target in any of the AMI levels, that would be something that we would uh, bring back and have a discussion in the fall. Good. Well, I look forward to hearing about that 50 to 80 percent uh, category um, in the fall. So um, thank you for that. Um, so, and I like too the way that uh, you know the goals have been broken out by this level of affordability. I think that that's really helpful. Um, I think it's especially important to break the goals out that way um, because we can't achieve the goals of deeply affordable housing without significant support, as you just mentioned. So, to have it in that category and to to see what we we need to do uh, it really helps us focus on how we accomplish that. Um, so, and I think, you know, our, I'll, I'll be interested. I think 5,700 sounds good, but, um, you know, I just think in general um, that I, I would like to set the goal as kind of the best case scenario. So if everything goes as it should, um, and you've proven that you can exceed the previous goal, so there's, you know, a lot of uh, good work done there, um, I'd like to, you know, kind of keep that as the standard. What is the best we can do? And you know, we may need to adjust. So when you come back at some point, we, we can, you know, look at the analysis and um, if there's an adjustment uh, that needs to be made, I think we can do that. Um, but again, I, I just appreciate such a well-organized, comprehensive update. Um, the task ahead in providing the housing uh, people can afford is difficult, but when we have a plan like this, it shows a path forward and certainly gives me hope. So uh, thank you for that and look forward to hearing what comes along the way and back in the fall. Councilmember Newenhouse. Thank you. Um, I'll echo uh, my colleagues' comments. It's great work, and uh, really appreciate the, the overview because we should be very proud of what we've accomplished thus far. Um, great, great work over um, uh, many, many years by many council members, and um, we are making progress. And I think um, uh, we're, we're, we're an example to the to the to the region in terms of, of what we're doing. Can we do more? Of course, but. Um, at the same time, um, I, I think we all deserve to uh, pat ourselves on the back to a certain extent um, with, with the policies that we've implemented and the goals that we've set. Um, really appreciate the, the, the data-driven uh, metric approach. Um, um, although I want to clarify two things. One, these are based on Bellevue needs and not necessarily what King County's um, uh, needs assessment is is that would that be would that be correct? Uh, that is correct, uh, Councilmember. We did okay. use our uh, Bellevue housing needs assessment. Thank you. And then um, and then how do we since this is data driven? How do we calculate those that want to move to Bellevue? How is how is that calculated? I don't under, and I hear this all the time. We have to we we have to calculate those who want to move to Bellevue, but. How, how do we do that? How, how, do, how do we understand and, and, and get to a number to understand how much or how many people would want to live in the city of Bellevue? Do you want to take that one? Yeah, I can speak to that. So our um, housing needs assessment methodology was based on our overall growth target of 35,000 housing units. And so we did not look at everyone who could potentially move to Bellevue or wants to, but we did cap it at that 35,000 number. And so that methodology looked at current needs within the city, so the mismatch between our existing households at different income levels and the number of housing units affordable to them. And then the remainder of the need, which I believe was about 30,000 units, um, was evenly distributed by income based on um, the socioeconomic characteristics of those who work in Bellevue and the socioeconomic characteristics of those who live in King County. Um, and so the total uh, was based on that 35,000 um, housing unit growth target, and it was broken down by those different populations. Okay. I hear the growth target, and <laughs> I'm still not really understanding how we come to that number to those individuals that actually want to come here, that, that actually goes into that, into that number. And we can take that conversation uh, offline to understand that a little bit better, but I'm still not hearing how, how we come to that number. Um, I will um, echo, as some of my colleagues have said, I'm a huge fan of the preservation and invest, invest, invest in that. I, I, and I think that should be part of our overall, uh, count towards our overall goal. I mean, certainly if we lost 
right? That would go against it. That would hurt our goal, right? So I think if we preserve, uh, we should count it um, as, as, as well. Uh, big fan of, 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 the, of the C1, and we're seeing some great activity there with faith-based properties taking advantage of that. So that is uh, great, great to see, and anything we can do to further encourage that. I'm a big fan of um, incentives, um, I think, is, is a critical piece to this as well. Um, not really a fan of the of, of, of mandatory, and I think if, if as, as Deputy Mayor uh, Malakutian mentioned about the stakeholder engagement, I think is so key to this, really understanding how is this going to pencil out? How is it going to make sense to them? What incentives are going to drive them to develop, especially that zero to 50, which, as Emilio, you mentioned, is going to be the toughest piece of this. If we can't get that number right, it's going to be very challenging for us to, to, to build that capacity and get to those numbers. So um, the, the, the more stakeholder engagement um, that we do, the better. And, we, and we've been doing that. And we've made adjustments, as, as you mentioned, the first part of this presentation that have made it quicker and faster and more affordable. So we, 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 you know, I, I do believe we can get there. Um, so, um, like the number um, and 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 the process to date, I think makes sense. I think we, you know, certainly want want some more details as we, as we continue to move forward here. Um, but would encourage those three, and then all that stakeholder engagement that you've already started and uh, continue continue going forward there. But uh, very excited uh, by this plan as shared by my my, my colleagues. Um, I think it's a it's it's a worthy goal. I think one that we could potentially adjust uh, depending our success or lack thereof as, as, as we move forward. Um, and, and, it, I, and I think it is a bit of a stretch goal. It's 40%, right, of, of the, the total number of, uh, of, 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 of units. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a big number, but um, uh, we've done it once before, um, so I think we can, we can do it again. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Council Member Lee. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, well, affordability. Now, Bellevue has always been a, a not very affordable city, you know, uh, because everybody wants to live in Bellevue. Bellevue is such a great place, so it's a problem, but it's also a good thing because of our success. Uh, so I like the, uh, the target because we do want to, we know it's enough, not as affordable as many cities around us, you know. So we do need to take care of, uh, for whatever reason, where people who live here, who is want to age in place, who has scaling down, you know, they have challenges. And we have new people, we wouldn't know why. The reason, I don't need to go through that. So I think the target you have, and based on what you have done, you know, that's amazing work you have done. Kudos to you guys. You know, we have exceeded. And so definitely that's a very good baseline. And you can, uh, you, you know what the, the market well, supply is, right? You can continue to do many of the things you do. And I kind of agree with the uh, you know, Council Member Newhouse on most of what he said. Uh, we need, I'd like to have a data driven uh, to determine. We know, you know, sort of what can using some of the data information, we know what the, the needs, are, needs are in a way, right? But we, had the, we have to also know what the supply will be. So that's important. So we need to know, you've, you've done that already. You know, we have all kinds of different incentives we are doing. And uh, so uh, I, I believe that, uh, you know, in order to meet uh, the demand, the needs, we need to have some real good data-driven analysis, uh, which you are saying you would. Because I believe success comes from, uh, from a, a, you mentioned used to a test, right? You want to test the reality, test the actual needs. And I've used the word, you know, trial and error. Basically, it's testing whatever you are doing. And then you can make adjustments. So I really like the idea that you're going to be talk, talking to us, briefing us, looking at the supply side, looking at the demand side, and then see what kind of adjustment can we make. So I like that. If you can take a look at chart 17, Paige, I would like to uh, ask you a question there. Uh, you can see from that, you know, we have uh, the units, various units. Uh, we, we, we are not, we have average annual production. Then we have needed future production. So my question is, how, can you explain why we cannot meet the needs? What do we need to do in order to not 
overestimate one way or the other. Yeah, so the, the, the thing to highlight on this uh, chart, uh, two things really, is um, our new target is significantly more than our previous one. So it's 570 per year. So that's, right. that's, a, that's the headline. And then the second one is the 0 to 30 and 30 to 50 um, those those uh, relatively small blue light blue bars is what we've produced, and the dark blue is what we need to do moving forward. So um, those are the toughest ones to get. They're the most expensive from a subsidy standpoint, and those are the ones where we're real, we're really going to have to think through what tools and approaches are going to have the council feel comfortable to have that as a as a target. So that's those are probably the two main points from this graphic. So are we setting your target based on that reality, based on that? implementation we're having a starting point right now so let's let's uh, underline starting point target we want to go back and do some outreach with the community and look at what tools would be needed uh, to especially achieve those 0 to 30 well, and 30 point to is, 50 shouldn't we be established a target based on what we can supply and then if we can implement it successfully then we can have a new target if we don't, then maybe we need to figure out how can we increase the supply so that we're not setting up unrealistic expectations one yeah. or the other. So I think our, our uh, intent was to have tonight the starting point, be able to go back, meet with the stakeholders, do some homework, and come okay. back to the council okay. in the fall, and yeah. then you're confirming things. So, sure. so the, we're not doing our final confirmation tonight. This is the okay, starting good. point. Yeah, that's yeah. a good rationale. I can live with that. Good. The key is that we need to make sure we have the reality we can adjust. I think that's the key. So uh, I definitely uh, like your goals, target. We have to set it. And it's based on what we've done you know, up to this point. So it's very, seem to be realistic, even though that chart gave me a little bit of concern. But I think we still can make adjustments. Uh, so I feel that the process, as I suggested, as long as we are going to use database, as long as we are answering some of, uh, you know, Councilmember Newhouse's concern about what we're looking at, you know, the, what's, the, what's the demand, what's the needs that we're looking at. And uh, so I'm happy with it. I'm happy, looking forward to having this kind of conversation ongoing. Thank you. Thank you. So here's what I've heard from Council, and I kind of want head nods after I'm done just let me finish what I'm saying. After I'm done saying all this, to just make sure we all agree with what I've heard. But what are you going to say, Council Member Zahn? Oh, sorry. I, I did want to make one comment and get one clarification. So if we're allowed to have a second round, I'd like to do that. Okay. Um, okay. So um, I've been listening to my colleagues, and, and I take back what I commented about of having a separate numbers around preservation. I. As I've thought about it, the 5,700 that's inclusive of new and preservation makes sense to me. So I just wanted to put that on the record that I um, had some things in my head that I was talking myself through, and I, I'm now comfortable with that. Um, I did have one question, though, because of Council Member Newenhouse's question. So on page 15, um, we talk about land use incentives at the 50 to 80 percent and then the market rate. So I think his comment was uh, how we might, as if we look at incentive versus mandatory at the zero to 50%. But if I look at this slide, that really deep affordability, we were not intending for that to be uh, a developer incentive or mandatory, right? So what I had always heard is that when we get to that deeper affordability, we're really talking about subsidizing that um, so I just wanted to get that clarity because when you come back to have that discussion around inclusionary versus mandatory, uh, we're talking about 80% and below and not 50% and below. Is that correct? Because I, I think that would be an important nuance to really understand. Uh, I would, uh, this is the generalized level of support as we look at all the different systems out there. Sometimes these bars do overlap a little bit, so we'll tease out some of those nuances between those middle two bars. Uh, there are some, some cities do incentives or mandatory that do approach down to the 50% level, but that's more of the anomaly than the, the common. The more common is to be kind of in the heart of that 50 to 80% level. Council okay. Member. It's helpful to, to get that understanding. Thank you. 
Okay, so what I'm hearing from my colleagues is that um, we're good with the goal, good with the process, want to tease out in the data the home ownership, um, think about using $50, $90 for housing preservation and other zero to 50% AMI um, funding, be aggressive with future goals, continue with stakeholder engagement, and reassess our goal as we proceed. So is that, can I get a head nod or a, or, okay. And I have a question. Okay, Council Member Stokes had a question first. Yeah, I still have a question about, and it's been raised. No, excuse me, still have a question about uh, the, the difference between somebody who's living in a place now and maybe two years from now will be uh, that you know they they'll want to tear it down and they get they go out and be uh, homeless, and in the meantime, the numbers we have we're not we will not be addressing the number of people out there right now who are homeless. Uh, and if we and I don't think we're going to have a lot of these places that will actually do what we're talking about, but if we have four or five. Uh, uh, facilities that have a hundred people living in it that really and and we put our money and our time and everything into that and neglect the people who have been out there and need home, need to be there that's a separate thing both of them need to be dealt with be I, don't, I don't know that's that all. we're not dealing with people who are currently homeless council member Stokes I mean I know that in this plan there's the entire spectrum of housing affordabilities and we're hearing about micro-housing using MFTE. If they use MFTE and a voucher, that brings housing down to $300 a month. And that does address people who are currently homeless but are working. So I think that this does a number of things. I think it um, prevents people from becoming homeless because there is a spectrum of housing that they can afford lower than what they're paying today. Right. And it also gives a much lower entry point that we've ever had before in rents as well as affordabilities. But this, what, what's happened up to now is that a significant number of the people, uh, of our overall number, comes from people who were where we went in and helped uh, preserve a house or a facility. And so the number, but we, we know we have more people out there needing this than even the numbers we're working on. And so if somebody goes, it, it's important to not have, have them become homeless. But if they become homeless, um, we're, we're taken away from the people who need, need something. They're two different things we do, to deal with. And if we... There have been people who have been in, they're in a house and they've been home, uh, not homeless, and now they're going to be homeless, and we say, okay, we'll go get, put them back in a house. Meantime, the 100 people over here who have been needing a house for some time, that cuts down the amount of money and it cuts down our, our goals to work with this group. So it's, that's why I'm saying they're, they're two separate different things, and we, can do, we need to do both of them. But... Uh, and I'm presuming that we're going to have more than one or two uh, houses, uh, facilities that, that have to be, you know, that, that they're going to get rid of. But I just, it just seems like we're, we kind of cut down what we want to work on. You know, one thing I, know, I think all. that people don't understand with housing preservation is oftentimes, most, almost all the time, when they preserve housing, they actually reduce the rents. So people who are tripled up in an apartment can actually afford to have their own apartment. And so it's not just preserving the building and preserving existing rents. It's actually coming in and reducing the rents and holding them as affordable for forever, for as long as the entity that owns it and created that, which has been the housing authority, maintains that. So it has actually increasing the housing stock of affordable housing. But that, that's not, that's separate from the people out there who don't have a house and need a house. And at some point you could say- So families that are tripled up in one apartment, you don't think they need? 
Well, yes, I do, but we, I'm saying we can do, we need to do both. Okay, all right. That's, that's Council different. Council members on. That's different. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if Council Member Stoltz, you're talking about the demand side, the need, and right now we're talking about how many units is our goal, which could accommodate both folks that become homeless and need housing as well as those that have been doubling up. So I wonder if it's a both and. So today we're talking about the number of units we need. So is this a question for staff to say, as you think holistically about the need, have we accounted for the, the population that Council Member Stokes is talking about as you came up with the number of the 5,700? Would, yeah. would that be an appropriate question for what you're asking? Yeah, we're happy to, to walk you through the, the, the needs assessment. The needs assessment is a snapshot in time. So we, mm -hmm. we did it uh, when we did the 2017 strategy. We updated it in 2022. Can we, we take intend. this offline maybe sure. because yeah, that's yeah. all in yeah. the packet? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds okay. good. Okay, Sorry. Council Member Lee, you had a question. Thank you. Yeah, I respectfully uh, want to suggest to the mayor, uh, instead of aggressive uh, target, perhaps we can use a data-driven uh, as uh, the staff mentioned, uh, needs assess I think, target. I think yeah, the fact that we include reassessing the goal as we proceed right. is using data to do that. So I right. think that covers that. But maybe that. aggressive might make a little bit of a... Okay. Can I get a head nod on who's yeah. okay with aggressive goals in the future? Um, okay. So we've got a majority of the council that's okay with that. All right, so I think you've been given some feedback, and we really appreciate the presentation. And with that, we are adjourned. Oh, no. no. I was just going to leave it hanging. Yeah. Uh, I move to direct the staff <laughs> to pro proceed with developing an updated affordable housing target for the city of 5700 units over 10 years based on a staff's recommended process and approach. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Woo. <laughs>